Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 28th meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2017. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones and as meeting papers are provided in a digital format for members, tablets may be used by members during the meeting. I'm delighted to see we've got a full house today, so all MSPs are present and we move to agenda item one. And the committee will take evidence on its inquiry into city region deals. And can I welcome Keith Brown, Cabinet Secretary for the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work, and Una Gill, Deputy Director, Enterprise and Cities, and Morag Watts, Head of Region and City Partnerships Team, Scottish Government. Uh, you are welcome. And Lord Duncan of Springbank, Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Scotland, and Neil McLennan, Head of City Deals and Local Government, Scotland Office, UK Government. You are all uh, most most welcome. Um, just observing before we started this meeting, it can be challenging sometimes to get both Scottish and UK governments uh, scheduled to appear at committees at the same time. So we see this as an encouraging step uh, in, in relation to our city region deals inquiry. And we thank everyone present for, for making that happen. Now, I understand uh, both the Cabinet Secretary and Lord Duncan have got some opening statements uh, to make at this point. So we'll be delighted to hear those now. now Cabinet Secretary. Okay, thank you very much, Convener. Uh, it is the case that I think uh, Ian Duncan and I actually appear on many platforms uh, together, the Scottish Business Growth Scheme and various conferences, not least those on City Deal. So delighted to be here. In fact, I think Ian reminded me that I had danced at his wedding recently, although I can't remember dancing with him, which is what he said. But um, so um, we are here, obviously, to talk about the City Deals, and we believe that uh, strengthening Scotland's economy so that it benefits uh, everybody in Scotland is the very definition of inclusive growth and for us is front and centre of what we do. And city region deals are one of the key economic levers. So 83% of Scotland's population, that's 4.5 million people, live in the areas covered by existing or planned city region deals. According to the latest figures from 2015, that same area equates to 86% of Scotland's total GVA and 2.2 million jobs. That's 85% of all Scottish jobs. The Scottish Government is the biggest funder of city and region deals in Scotland, with commitments of over £1 billion to date. Uh, the investments we are making in city region deals will benefit Scotland as a whole, creating tens of thousands of jobs and upskilling labour markets. But they can do much more than that. They're based on, of course, proposals developed by regional partners, harnessing local intelligence to identify what's needed to unlock uh, inclusive growth. And they can also act to galvanise key partners uh, to come together to drive regional economies in ways that go well beyond the investments that they deliver. Um, but crucially for us, they focus on delivering inclusive economic growth. Uh, of course, our policy approach should not and is not just about cities and regions, although they are very important, as the figures I mentioned show. Um, for our economy and all of our people to flourish, we need inclusive economic growth in all of Scotland especially outside the traditional growth areas. Uh, inclusive growth, by definition, is about opportunities for everybody. And that's why the Enterprise and Skills Review made it clear that we're expanding our regional economic policy to go beyond city deals to support the creation of regional partnerships right across the country. And as I told the Economy Committee last week, I've agreed to establish a centre for regional inclusive growth. And that centre will provide a platform to share local and national data, analysis and evaluations. And it will also help support regional partnerships and city and region deals. So very pleased to be here today and delighted that the committee has taken interest in city deals at this early stage and look forward to answering any questions that the committee has. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary Lord Duncan. Um, thank you very much. Can I also say it is a pleasure uh, working alongside uh, Keith because the only way we can deliver the city deals is through cooperation. And indeed, important that this committee is beginning to examine what is going on because it is not just the two governments which are cooperating, but also the local authorities across Scotland. And I think that form of working, that collaborative form of working at the heart of the city deals is perhaps a model for how we might move in other areas as well. But let me just give you some background again. It might be useful for the committee before we begin to uh, delve into the questions. The UK government launched the City Deals programme back in December 2011 with the publication of the Unlocking Growth in Cities white paper. This set out our ambition to transfer powers and decision making to local leaders and businesses to support economic growth. Behind the City Deals, we have a recognition that it's a catalyst, a catalyst for the cities and for the wider hinterland. And it's important to stress that although there is often a city at the heart, they are not exclusively a city alone. So we are looking at implementing across the UK and certainly south of the border new governance arrangements 
but across the whole of the UK, developing economic growth strategies, which I believe will dovetail very closely with the Scottish Government's ambition for inclusive growth and increasing capacity to manage devolved funding and spending. The City Deal programme in Scotland started in 2014, uh, some three years after the City Deals were launched in uh, England. We now have four agreed, uh, three more are in negotiation, and we expect progress to be made on those uh, in the due course. Uh, the UK Government has so far committed um, just over £1 billion to that programme. Our ambition is a very simple one. Uh, it's to support balanced and sustainable economic growth and to improve the health of the local, regional and national economy. And again, it should be, as I said at the beginning, a means by which our governments can cooperate and collaborate, because after all, we are governing the same people, and at heart, both governments have the same objective, which is to deliver better lives for those in those particular areas. Scotland does have particular challenges, and we know that the Scottish Government's own figures reflect upon those, and that's why the city deals themselves are so useful, I believe, in hopefully transforming the, the landscape as we understand it. As well as that, the UK Government has moved forward in a number of other areas which we hope will complement the City Deals approach, and that will include the industrial strategy, and we should hear some more information about that in the next week or so. Now, I could explain in greater detail, but I think I'll wait and be prompted by the questions. So, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you to uh, both of you for, for those opening statements. Perhaps it might be worth opening up, because a, a theme running through the evidence we've taken so far is trying to establish whether the initial city region deal, which was the Glasgow one, um, was particularly well managed at the outset in terms of getting the balance right between economic growth and inclusive growth. And indeed, with, with Councillor Susan Aiken, who's, who is now chairing the, 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 the city region deal cabinet, uh, saying as much when when she came to to, to, to this this committee and indeed uh, we heard academics at another evidence session talking about the possibility to retrofit uh, some of the the first deals to better align in relation to inclusive growth now I have to say I have to declare an interest that may benefit my constituency for the Glasgow city region deal for the north of Glasgow and areas such as Hamilton Hill and Rock Hill and the canal network may may uh, boost regeneration in an area long since deprived. So real benefit to my constituency, that kind of retrofitting. But it does lead to the question about what the, the purpose of city region deals are. Is it about inclusive growth? But that doesn't necessarily maximise growth. So regenerating communities and getting communities where perhaps there's not a lot of econ economic activity happening and the need for regeneration and bringing them forward might create less economic activity than, say, giving a boost to an area that already has a significant degree of economic activity in it. So I'm quite keen to understand the balance between maximising economic growth and inclusive growth and where both governments sit in relation to that, because that will, of course, determine what projects proceed in the pipeline of projects for the city region deals, not just the ones that might be retrofitted, but the ones that are still uh, in the pipeline coming forward. So inclusive growth, maximising economic growth, are there tensions there? I think on your first part of your question, convener, um, the Glasgow City deal was unlike the other city deals that we've had. Um, from the Scottish Government's point of view, we were asked at the very last minute, essentially, to contribute half a billion pounds. There wasn't the prior discussion. Um, and so the ability for us to emphasise or prioritise things like inclusive growth was limited. I think it's also true to say that city deals have, um, if you like, matured over the period since then, so no longer resembling a straightforward list of infrastructure projects, uh, more involvement in the private sector um, and more emphasis on transformational growth. In relation to the possibility of, as you've called it, retrofitting the Glasgow City deal, what we have said, and I think it's also true for Ian, but he, he obviously wants to speak for himself, is that we are willing to listen to that within certain constraints. The constraints would be that one area should not be um, disadvantaged as a result of changes. So you see two council areas suddenly finding projects moving out of their area with no replacement. So I think that's... That's important. Um, the quantum's not going to change. The billion pounds behind that, that's not, from our point of view, that's not going to change. And that should be understood. But beyond that, I think it is true that city deals have, um, to use the overworked phrase, been on a journey. They have matured over time. And it's right, I think, that uh, if the councils and partners involved want to look at that again, they should do so. And to the extent they do so, we would like to see 
although it's very important, I think, to get this point, that uh, city deals are characterised by the fact the initiative comes from the local authorities and other partners. It's not the Scottish Government's intention, I don't think it's the UK Government's intention, to go behind that and try and be the ones that come up with the ideas or, or, or change those. But we would want to see in any changes and we want to see in any um, city-region deals that inclusive growth um, is prioritised. Um, I think on the tension that you say between growth and inclusive growth, if that's one way of characterising it, that can be the case. So you could have, in theory, 20% growth and only 20% of people enjoying the benefits of that growth. And then you have to work out, is that what you want to do? And it's not for us. We want to have growth, but we want everybody to have the chance of accessing the benefits of that growth. So that will be a priority for us. It's fundamental to our economic strategy. Scotland is gaining something of an international reputation for this in terms of inclusive growth. And we would want to see uh, inclusive growth recognised, in, and, and we are seeing it recognised, in the city deal proposals that are coming forward. So there is, I think... If not attention, certainly there's a balance to be struck there, and we would certainly come down in favour of inclusive growth. Okay, thank you, Lord Duncan. Yes, <clears throat> in lots of ways, the the Glasgow deal benefited in so far as it was first in the queue, but there were challenges as well, which I think the subsequent city deals have been able to benefit from more significantly. Uh, and the recent um, Edinburgh deal, for example, was able to benefit from a wider audit, which demonstrated, again, where particular focus could deliver particular outcomes. I think, and I've met now with uh, Susan Aitken to speak about this, and we do recognise that it can be examined. Keith is exactly right, however. What we don't want to find is that of the eight local authorities, money begins to move from one to another, and then there is disagreement within the consortium, creating, I think, tension, which we wouldn't wish to see. And again, it's very important to stress that the projects themselves still must grow organically from the local level. It's not the job of either government to impose projects or to determine uh, those projects, but rather to make sure that when they are developed, that they deliver against our specific objectives, which in the UK government's instance is economic growth, and in the Scottish government's it's inclusive growth. Is there a tension between the, the two of them? Well, Keith rightly points that out. One of the challenges which we have, of course, is that we must operate in our uh, particular spaces, if you like, the notion of the devolved space and the reserved space. And that, I think, in the first, uh, the Glasgow deal was probably less well-defined than it became later. And I think that was part of the, the evolution of these as they have progressed. The key thing we're looking at now is to make sure that there is the right outcome for the Glasgow local authorities in their widest sense, that we get an outcome which is delivering against the of governments, both governments' objectives, which is to see real growth, and also that the people of Glasgow should be able to experience and benefit from that growth so that they can actually recognise it as a value that the governments themselves have invested. And of course, not just the governments, but the local authorities themselves. And again, as these uh, evolve in some of the other um, growth deals and um, city deals, we've seen more private investment as well. So I think there will be opportunities to re-examine whether we can retrofit will depend much more upon what uh, we are told by the partners than what we would seek to instruct. That, that's helpful for setting a context, I think, to, to, to this evidence session. I think it's reasonable to say in the Glasgow experience, the evidence we heard was one of critical analysis rather than criticism. It's about how you learn from, from the journey, if you like. I was a regional MSP at the time of, 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 the, of the Glasgow City Region deal coming into existence. And, Personally, was opposing uh, one of the projects, the Cathkin Relief Road, which I think came in at 18 or 19 million pounds. Now, it's built, it's there, it's working. Um, I still think, personally, think it was a waste of money. It had nothing to do with inclusive growth. I'm not even much sure how, how sure it was to do with growth in the first place. But hands up, local authorities wished that to be one of the projects. I was representing that area. I disagreed, but local democracy prevailed. So I would say that wasn't value for money, but the project was allowed to proceed. So in terms of value for money or measuring outcomes or auditing the process by which these things are procured and delivered, who's doing that kind of work? Who would do that? Well, Cabinet uh, Secretary. If I uh, go first, I think we have now a board which um, comprises both the UK and Scottish governments, and that will uh, carry oversight. In particular, in relation to the Glasgow uh, city deal, what was put in place was something called an assurance framework. 
Now that wasn't, as you've quite rightly said, for us to go on and say, we don't think this project's value for money um, in terms of what you could do otherwise if you had a different priority. What we uh, do insist on, uh, both governments, is that we have a proper business case, that it is uh, something that stacks up and that the integrity of the project itself um, is overseen. Now, there's also an element of risk in that. So uh, it's in the nature of infrastructure projects, sometimes more out with Scotland than within Scotland, I would say, for them to overrun. Um, we have around a £245 million underspend um, or saving on the Queen's Ferry crossing, but infrastructure projects being what they are, they can have cost overruns and time overruns. Those are carried out at the risks of the local authorities. So on any given project, if that project you refer to was £18, £19 million, pounds, if it ended up costing £29 million, pounds, that is for local authorities to pick up. And both governments have made it clear we're not there to, to bail out um, uh, overruns or infrastructure projects which don't come in on time and on budget. What we do at the earlier stage, through the assurance framework which I've mentioned, uh, and through the board, uh, which is uh, there, um, we have a, a monitoring role in respect of that. And over and above that, as you know, again, uh, and you'll see it replicated in subsequent deals, but in relation to Glasgow, you'll have the Glasgow Cabinet, uh, City Region Deal Cabinet, which has been established for that same purpose. Um, however, the, the quantum is the quantum, so if they end up going over on one project, then it will be at the expense of either the councils and other partners involved, or of um, the... Um, the ability to carry all the projects they'd like to carry out. So we do take a close interest in it. We do have an assurance framework. We have a responsibility in terms of public money being spent. So we carry that through through the joint board, which I've mentioned, and also through the assurance framework. Lord Duncan? Uh, one of the challenges, and we're, we're living through this right now in the deals which are evolving. So if we look at, say, the, the Tay Valley deal or the Stirling and Clip Manager deal, the processes we're going through right now, where we have the projects uh, developing from the grassroots up, they still need to meet the criteria whereby we can satisfy our respective treasuries that they are delivering against the criteria set out. And those criteria are clearly agreed to try and de determine what, therefore, can be the gross value added of a particular project so that we can see that they are going to be uh, fulfilling what we anticipated when we signed off the, the, the heads of terms and the overall deal. I think one of the, the challenges is when you look at some of the elements in the Glasgow deal itself based on infrastructure, it isn't always easy to see the multiplier or, or, or to feel the warmth of the new road or recognise what it delivers to the area. And I appreciate that that in, in essence can be a challenge. And I think the first deal did reflect, <clears throat> in some respects, not quite a wish list from local authorities, but a recognition of where work had not been done and could be done now, that money was available, and they had a backlog of areas where they would like to see that spent. What we've done is we've refined the city deal approach is recognise that it isn't just meant to be fulfilling existing obligations. It's meant to be new investment which delivers against clear objectives, which when they are explained are understood by particularly those in the region itself and they're able to welcome that. So there's no resentment when they discover, in fact, that money's been spent on one project or another. In terms of the Glasgow deal, again, as, as Keith rightly says, we've fixed the, the, the budget uh, that we can invest in that area, and so any challenges that come thereafter will have to be met from within that particular quantum. But that being said, we will do all we can through the monitoring process uh, and working closely with the participants to make sure that where there are any issues that begin to develop, they are identified early and are addressed to prevent the very suggestion of uh, overrun or, or, or money not delivering against expectation. Okay, in a moment I'm going to bring Graham Simpson in just so he knows he's coming in in a second. But a very, very brief follow-up question for Lord Duncan. You mentioned gross value addict in relation to, to projects. Just to double-check that um, the UK government wouldn't wouldn't say of a city region deal, well, we don't think the GVA is sufficient enough in this and the local authorities would go, well, actually, we know that another an, another project would give a greater GVA, but we think for the overall inclusive growth of this project, this is the one we want, even though uh, the UK government might think it doesn't stack up in GVA. In terms of the local democratic decision-making, what would the UK, I know we're talking in, in, theoretically, what, what would the UK government's position be on that? Well, we can only operate and have now become much more focused on operating on what would be the reserved space. So our, cre our key criterion for examining that is the GVA. That is the means by which we do so. However, 
at no point in our discussions with local authorities have we sought to, um, in our examination, move anything other than what we believe we can fund. So we've been very clear where we believe we can operate and what we believe we can deliver. But importantly, and again, this is where some of the elements have to actually interweave, there may be elements of cooperation between the two governments where our spend complements the inclusive growth ambition of the Scottish government, where we actually step into what might be more traditionally devolved areas in order to do that. So it's not our ambition in any way to rule out projects on that basis. It's we have a suite of criteria that we must fulfil. Duncan, that maybe the money should lose its identity once it's put into the pot of cash for city region deal. So we shouldn't be talking about a, a UK pound or a Scottish government pound. We should be talking about a city region deal pound and the local authorities being the drivers of that locally should determine, with agreed criteria, we should determine what those what those projects are. Because we've heard it before about devolved uh, investment and reserved investment. This is strategic city region deal investment. Should the money not lose its identity? And if local authorities want to maximise inclu uh, uh, inclusive growth, perhaps expensive GVA, is that something you'd be willing to consider tweaking the criteria on at a UK level? No. That would be unlikely to be tweaked at a UK level on that basis, I'm afraid. The Treasury sets the, uh, the criteria that we have to work within. And in truth, the reason why there is clear division is because the Treasury would argue that they are, through various other means, through the block grant and so on, already supporting the Scottish Government in its investment in the ongoing project. So we have to be very careful that the, the money itself is assessed according to the criteria that we must work within. Now, I, I, I don't want to get an artificial division in relation to that answer, but it was very definite. It was it was very black and white. Now, th this committee will have to consider all the evidence we get in the way, in in the round in relation to city region deals. But is it something that you would consider, based on see the recommendations of this report, to take back to the UK government to make that case? I mean, the Treasury are there to be to be lobbied and influenced and cajoled to see a bigger picture if it would be for the better management of city region deal. So that was a fairly absolutist answer in relation to changing that criteria because you don't think the Treasury would move. Is it something that you'd be willing to consider yourself? Well, I suppose I'd have to flip it around and ask another question. I'm being very clear to avoid there being any doubt about that. By all means, if you write the report, I will happily pass it on to the Treasury. I suspect, however, that their criteria will not be changed on that basis because they do see it as spending in the reserved space, which they're able to do, versus the Scottish Government spend in the devolved space, which they should do. And if the UK Government ends up spending in a devolved space, I would argue it's spending twice. So by all means, I'm not seeking to uh, in any way influence the report you write, and I'm very happy to take that back to the UK Government and to the Treasury, but I'm setting up what I suspect will be the outcome of that. Quite clearly. I am but one person on the committee. We'll have to wait and see what the committee recommends, but that, that's very clear, Lord Duncan. Uh, Graham Simpson. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to follow up on uh, what, what you were both saying about the, the Glasgow um, city deal. Um, uh, it in interested, Mr. Brown, that you, you, you feel that, that other deals have learnt from, shall we say, the mistakes of the Glasgow deal. Um, Lord Duncan, um, you mentioned uh, particular projects in the Glasgow City deal that can cause uh, local resentment, uh, and that's certainly the case. Um, the convener mentioned uh, one, uh, which did cause local resentment. Um, I'm certainly aware of others um, in, in that vicinity uh, which will cause local resentment. Um, road projects, which appear to have no um, obvious case, um, um, eighty-five million pounds worth of road projects uh, in East Kilbride, which w we haven't seen a, a, a business case for, um, but I, I guess they, they they fit the description that you made, uh, Lord Duncan, of projects that have been sat around uh, for years. Um, councils have seen the opportunity to spend money, uh, and frankly, nobody can see the benefit. So. A couple of questions, really. Do you think, um, either of you, do you think that uh, in that Glasgow deal, changes can be made? Uh, will the governments ask for changes to be made? Um, and if, uh, perhaps, Mr. Brown, if you could be more explicit about what you think the lessons are uh, from the Glasgow deal uh, for other deals. Cabinet Secretary. 
first lesson is if you're going to have a deal involving the Scottish government, you should talk to the Scottish government first. I think uh, essentially agreeing a deal and then coming to the Scottish government with a demand for money is not the best way to get the best deal. Um, but I think it's also true to say that was uh, a deal done in the earlier stages of city deals generally, and it has moved on. I'm not saying I'm not characterising them as mistakes, but I do think uh, it's moved on. So you'll have seen in Aberdeen and Inverness more involvement from the private sector at an earlier stage. Aberdeen in particular, a very large contribution from the private sector. Um, and also a more rounded approach, which can lead to a transformational um, effect on the local economy. So emphasis much more on things like broadband, uh, skills uh, and housing in terms of being a, a factor in economic growth. So I think they have uh, matured over time. On the point, no, we'll not be asking for changes in the Glasgow City deal. The Scottish Government won't be asking for uh, changes in that. Uh, we will be receptive to listening to proposals for change, as I'd mentioned earlier on, if the partners to that deal uh, want to make changes within the constraints which I mentioned earlier on, so the quantum, making sure that different areas are not disadvantaged by changes. Uh, we are, and I think this is true, we've had conversations, Ian and myself, about this. The, the governments are agreed that we will be receptive to listening to proposals for change, but it's not for us to go in uh, and propose changes. That's not how we see it. And also, had that been the case when the Glasgow City deal was struck, that the Scottish Government being, if you like, um, um, coming in at that stage, had then said, no, you're not doing that, you're not doing this, the local authorities themselves would have said, with some justification, that's what we are saying are our priorities. Um, now, we can't fund all the priorities. We do pick and choose which ones we can we can support and it has to be done within um, obviously our budget um, and we won't, um, just to go back to the convener's previous point, say that's um, now um, city deal money, in effect it is, but we have to have accountability for the money that we spend, so that's why we have the continuing role in terms of monitoring. But it, it is true that they are over a long period of time and things can change, so I think we're duty bound to be receptive to that, but we shouldn't be the ones to initiate that change, it should come from within the partners locally. Lord Duncan? Yeah, well, I, would, I would certainly echo that. Um, if we look at the, the UK government spend inside the, the city deal, it has focused again on the, sort of the innov innovation and growth area. And if I just list where it is, you'll see why, again, in response to your earlier point, convener, moving the money around becomes more problematic. So um, the innovation and growth, three particular projects, um, supporting the development of an imaging centre of excellence as part of the 64 million investment in the stratified medicine at the new South Glasgow Hospitals campus, support the development of a 4 million Medicity Scotland facility, support the development of a new 4 million centre for business incubation and development in a Tontine building in Glasgow's Merchant City. So again, in the areas where we put money in, there's a very clear, uh, not quite ring fencing, but a very clear function so that we can then track the money as it moves through. Um, the, the, the earlier projects were more difficult as we look back on them now because we've learned lessons. And I don't think that would necessarily have been able, either governments have been able to dictate to the local authorities what it was that they were to pursue, but they had to recognise both governments had a suite of criteria that they had to meet and obligations that they had to fulfil too. So the projects which did emerge were those which best fit the criteria. Um, several projects didn't make it that far and didn't secure funding in that particular round. Those that did are those which we collectively believed we could support uh, and did so, uh, and continue to monitor to make sure that they deliver and are um, on time and are able to deliver as per expectation. Mm. Liam Simpson? Um, but, but there's a feeling, um, and we've heard this strongly in, in evidence, um, that communities feel uh, they're not they've not been involved uh, in city deals, not just Glasgow. Things are done to them and not with them, not by them. Um, so. I mean, think about the, the, the roads projects that, that, that I've mentioned, uh, some of which haven't even been built yet. Um, these are projects which people don't want, they don't see any value uh, for, um, they're not involved, they're pushed on them by, by the partners in the city deal. That's not the right way to do it, surely. You should be involving communities right from the start and involving businesses um, uh, Mr. Brown, you mentioned uh, involving the private sector. That's come through in evidence as well. Um, certainly in Glasgow, they, uh, businesses don't feel involved. Um, so perhaps you could pick up on those points. It's involvement of communities 
which should be right at the start. I agree with that, and you are seeing much more of that, for example, in the Stirling Club Manager deal. Um, I think there's been substantial um, involvement, uh, certainly in the early stages, from Stirling Council and latterly from Club Manager Council. But the fundamental point here is that this is a local government committee. We're talking about local government, which has its own mandate. If local government comes forward and says, this is what we want to do in relation to this, I don't think it's for the Scottish government or the UK government, but it will be their point of view, to look beyond that and say no and second guess it. Um, I, I didn't see, of course, the Scottish government wasn't involved in the early stages, but I didn't see howls of protest from one or other partner saying they were being forced to do this by um, a collective. These, these are ones which were presented to both governments as the priorities, and it will be for local government to justify the extent to which they have or have not engaged. I think, to be fair, we are um, more alive to that, and the local authorities um, involved now in city deals are more alive to the need to have um, that kind of popular uh, or public engagement. Um, I think that is true, but it is for those that are coming forward with proposals to make sure that they consult uh, with the public. That's where it should happen. Lord Duncan? Yeah, I'm the Stirling and Clark Manager City Deal is perhaps the best evidence we have now of the wider engagement by the local authorities into the community. I mean, part of the challenge is such a large sum of money is being spent by all the partners. You would hope that the people in the, the city regions would welcome it and recognise what it's delivering, which should be transformative. And it is a little dispiriting, of course, to then discover that perhaps some of the money well, you know, of great quantity is not being appreciated. And I think that is a, I don't think either of us are particularly pleased to be hearing that. Um, that being said, Keith is right to point out that the projects which emerged and were funded by, not all projects were funded, several fell by the wayside, uh, were those which were, were, were pushed uh, and, and advanced by the, the, the consortium of local authorities. And it does become a challenge. And, and I would argue again, there is no single one-size-fits-all approach to the city deals. They don't look alike. The cities themselves are not alike in character. If you look at the Aberdeen city deal, for example, it's very closely allied with, I would call it a sector approach, which is around the oil and gas sector, which was a very clear dovetailing, and that worked very well. But that wasn't how the Glasgow deal evolved. If you look at the, the, the evolution of the Edinburgh deal again, much more of the, the university sectors driving forward elements of that. Um, if you look at the emerging elements of the, uh, the Tay Valley deal, again, each of them has a particularly different approach. Our hope would be that the, those putting forward the projects have secured the right level of not just commitment from the council, although that will ultimately be the determinant of it, but that they, as local representatives, have engaged widely with the communities which are affected to ensure that there is that buy-in um, the last thing we would want is billions to be spent and nobody to be pleased. It would seem to be the worst of all possible worlds. Yeah. Do you want to follow up on some of that, Mr Simpson? I'll just make a point and then we can move on to other questions. Um, okay. the, and the point is uh, no council uh, is, go is going to uh, deliver what you describe, uh, Mr Brown, as a howl of protest um, if you're throwing money at them. But the people on the ground might not like it. The councils will love it, but the people might not. So. Do you want to come back when that comes? If I could, that's the nub of the question. The question is for local authorities, though. It's not for, I think, the governments. We would be very quickly accused of centralisation if we were to say uh, this project should not go ahead because we believe you've insufficiently, you've got insufficient support. I mean, your basic point is true. If you think about a city deal over, say, 20 years, and if it doesn't enjoy support at the start, it's unlikely if it's one of the subsequent projects, say 10 years in, that's then done. And its relevance is not obvious to people and its support is not obvious. And that's why I have said, and I think uh, Ian agrees with this point, we're willing to listen to proposals for change, but it's the local authority that has to be the key body here. Fair, just for putting on the public record, the specific project that I mentioned, uh, I got a reply, if I recall, from the Cabinet Secretary for Finance back in the day, John Swinney, MSP, in relation to my reservations with that project and the reply I got was it's a matter for local authorities to prioritise and bring forward the project. So 
that's oh. just put that on the record because I had an involvement at, at the time. Okay, we'll move on now, Jenny Goldruth. Thank you, and good morning to the panel. Um, I was interested, Lord Duncan, um, in that, that last part there of where you said that the commitment from the, the Council will ultimately be the determinant of these projects. So I want to drill down on a specific constituency question, if that's okay. In Cabinet Secretary, you'll be aware that Leave Mouth uh, Real Link is a huge campaign in my own constituency. I've, I've spoken about it in Parliament um, regularly and raised it in a, a member speech recently with the Transport Minister. Um, and you also said, Cabinet Secretary, in your opening comments that we need growth outside the traditional growth areas. And, and you'll know that Glenrothes and Leaven fall into those gaps, I would argue, because Fife is part of that city-region deal. Um, so with regard to the evidence that our committee have heard previously, David Ross, who's the co-council leader in Fife, um, said in an evidence session, I think two weeks ago now, that the clear understanding that we got from government officials was that the project, the Leaven Mouth Rail Link in this instance, would not meet the specific criteria they were looking for in the city deal. And he has subsequently written to the committee to update his comments. And he says that in discussions between Scottish civil servants and council officers, it was made clear to us that the full project would not score highly under the criteria on which the Scottish government would consider the bid. So I would just like to ask a specific question to which I think I already know the answer. But did the Scottish government or the UK government at any time block uh, local authorities from specific bids? You mentioned um, the government officials and the process which led up to the deal. I would say that I was with um, Councillor Ross at the sign of the deal. I have no recollection of any objections being raised to the deal that was um, proposed. And if it had been the case that the Leavenmouth uh, rail link, and of course I can absolutely guarantee that rail projects are very problematic in trying to judge what the eventual cost and timeline will be, uh, the nearest one to Leavenmouth, where we have a new line, I think, is the one in my own constituency, um, Stirling to Alloa and Kincardine, started out in 2008 um, with a bid from myself, actually, as a local authority leader. Um, it was going to cost £6 million for the passenger. Everyone said it's a small line, it won't take much. £6 million for the passenger service, £13 million for the extension to the freight to Kincardine. It cost £85 million in the end and it wasn't completed for a number of years afterwards. So, um, as to the process, that wasn't part of the final proposal from Fife Council. Uh, Fife Council area, as you'll know, will benefit from two city deals, the whole Fife Council area, because it'll be in the Tay Cities deal. But as to the actual process behind you, their question, perhaps the officials who were involved in that might want to answer, because they're sitting very quietly just now, convenient. <laughs> of course, we'd like to uh, give a comment to that particular question. Uh, I'm happy to, to respond. Thank you, um, Nigel, thank you. Uh, so, uh, as the committee are aware and have heard from a number um, of people already, the process for considering propositions and proposals within a city deal um, is, is one um, that starts with the local authorities coming together uh, with their um, key regional partners to um, bring forward propositions. Uh, and during that process, there are some discussions around uh, exploring the detail, the readiness of these proposals um, uh, and, and the constraints that, that may uh, exist uh, with each proposition. So those discussions continue um, and the regional partners <coughs> evolve their asks um, through that process and, and that indeed was the case with this particular proposition um, and I think you've, you've heard about how that evolved and was taken forward. Ask a, a specific point then. Did the Edinburgh City Region deal ask local authorities to prioritise projects? Because David Ross is insinuating that it was a scoring used by Scottish government officials, and I want to find out if that's the case. Were, were local authorities asked to rank projects in any priority order? So we always talk to local authorities and invite them to identify the priorities within their, their deal proposals. Um, you'll be very well aware um, that the aspirations um, for regional deals uh, can be extremely large. Uh, and indeed, the Edinburgh proposal um, grew considerably during the, the process of discussion with it. So throughout those discussions, we are inviting the partners to be clear about their collective priorities for the, for the, um, for the region. Um, and to articulate their, their reasoning behind that, including the benefits that they think they will bring um, across, across the region and where they will sit with the region deal. Thank you. Um, I do struggle when I, when I listen to the, the Edinburgh City Region deal to point to things in my own constituency whereby there's going to be a direct benefit. So just with regard to that wider benefit, in David Ross's letter to the committee later, and Cabinet Secretary, this is another specific point for you, 
hope you don't mind uh, my asking you. Um, he says, I believe the funding from the Scottish Government for the Sheriff Hall Junction is around £120 million, representing around 40% of the Scottish Government's investment in the City Region deal. It was not a project that was submitted by the local authorities as part of the City Region deal, and as a consequence of the Scottish Government including this project in the overall funding, it may have been that other projects have been prioritised that have been prioritised by local authorities were not funded. Do you think that's true? I, I think the Sheriff Hall Junction will have been a priority for a number of the local authorities involved in it. But to be honest, this idea that we can now look back uh, to local authorities that freely and happily signed that city deal agreement and to see them now picking it apart, I think, is um, not the way uh, to go. Um, as you know, and quite rightly, the possibility of uh, funding the Leaving Mouth Rail Link has been taken forward through other means. You mentioned the debate in Parliament. And we're trying to work with local authorities, but I don't think it is fair to say when everyone sits down, as we all did, uh, for that city deal agreement and everyone freely signs it. And before we got to that stage, of course, we said, well, this is what we're thinking of doing. What do you think? And they all said they wanted to now go back to it and say, actually, we didn't like that part of it or didn't like that part of it. I don't think it's is, is fair to do that. We've tried to act in good faith. As, as Una says... Um, the Edinburgh City Deal, the first initiative from the Edinburgh City Deal was actually Edinburgh City Council who came to myself and John Swirry and said they didn't want any money. That's what they said at the start. We don't, we're not looking for money. We want a city deal. We don't want money. We can fund it through other things. It grew up, I think, in increments of a quarter of a billion pounds at a time after that. It just continually went higher and higher, as has been a feature of most city deals. So we do have to prioritise. And it's obvious that local authorities and their partners in putting forward their proposals are going to have to prioritise. But five council and the council leader freely signed up to that deal. OK, now, I think just uh, for clarity and for the record I should point out that Councillor David Ross who did give evidence last week did write to the committee to myself actually on the 20th of November and that's what the, that exchange was in relation to and that's public, a public available letter and, and it, it's on the, the, the committee page at, at, at the Scottish Parliament website. Um, if there's anything in it that um, any of the witnesses here would like to correspond with us in relation to feel free to do that but it's fair to be fair to councillor ross his full reply is is on the the scottish parliament website and those interested in that should go and go and look at the yeah. the, the full the full reply uh, okay we'll, we'll move on now alexander stewart thank you convener good morning we've touched on this morning already about the potential that these deals can bring to communities and to cities and and also the tensions that have existed and continue to exist but can i specifically to ask you about what happens in an area that does not have uh, built into the location uh, 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 a city deal. Uh, the ones who are, who are out with or find themselves between the rock and the hard place that's, that's not really meeting for their needs. And, and how can we really build a resilient local economy in that area? And how are we attempting to do that when they feel that they've been uh, excluded in some way from the process uh, and the support mechanisms that are put in place to provide that uh, location and that community uh, with the support going forward, do you believe they are sufficient? Can, can I say that we, the Scottish Government, have a commitment that every area, every part, every community of Scotland should benefit from uh, a deal. That's our commitment. Um, I think... To put it diplomatically, we are still working through, and it'll be interesting to hear uh, Ian's view on this. Uh, we have, so for example, areas like Murray, Argyle, Falkirk, the Islands, um, Dumfries and Galloway, a, a number of areas which wouldn't be covered by a city-region deal. And you're quite right to say that their local economies require support as well. So what we've said is we are willing to look at those. Ayrshire is a good example of one where... We have said now for quite some time that we are supportive of an Ayrshire growth deal and the Ayrshire Council has approached both governments and asked for government support. Now, again, it's not for me to say what the UK government's current position is, but the UK government did not want to commit to a growth deal in that sense. I think Andrew Dunlop at the time subsequently said that whatever they might want to do in the Ayrshire space would be done through the industrial strategy rather than through a deal. My point would be that the Scottish Government will go ahead and do this. We will provide support and we'll look at deals for every part of Scotland. It would be useful to know at this stage whether the UK Government wants to be part of that with us, whether it's their intention that they should also work in the way that we've done in city deals, uh, collaboratively together, or if we're doing separate things. And I think 
either one is perfectly legitimate, but I think we have to know, and I think we have to try and get um, get it worked out in terms of priority as well. So, for example, there's there's um, a proposal for a borderlands deal just now, and yet half of the borderlands or one of the two local authorities has already had a deal. Um, Falkirk's not had a deal, Argyle's not had a deal, Murray's not had a deal. So I think that th this is a good time, and it may be that we'll get some uh, clarity even in this week of the budget of the UK government's approach. Things have changed over the period of city deals, so the 50-50 requirement was there, first of all, that's less uh, of a um, determinant now. Um, the reserve space, you know, it would be useful to know from the UK government, if we're going to work together to maximise the benefit of a deal in a given area, what is the basis on which that's, take, on which that's taken place? So is the reserve thing um, to be how it's done? I think both governments have experienced situations where local authorities and partners seem to find it harder to come up with things in the reserve space, and so you get a preponderance of devolved, especially infrastructure projects. Um, if it is to, so I think we'd, it would be really useful to have a common understanding of how, if we're both going forward together on this, what the basis of that is, and if we're not, then we can crack on and do it. But I accept your fundamental point, which is that every part of Scotland deserves to get the support which the city region deals have had. Duncan? Yep, I'm right on board with that. The plan is that we should be able, I hope, again, we need to speak a lot more, Keith, you and I, about how we take it forward. But clearly, Scotland is more than its cities and the city's hinterlands, and there are a large number of areas. So my team, for example, this afternoon will be off to Argan and Butte to begin just early exploratory discussions to see what uh, is possible there. Uh, I've had meetings with each of the island local authorities, again, to see what their world looks like, uh, to see how we can begin to understand what the deals look like. Uh, the budget today may give a shout-out to this I can't confirm that because I have no idea if what we've asked is actually going to emerge in that. But the point being that we do need to commit into the space beyond the cities themselves. And that should therefore mean that the mosaic of Scotland is all coloured in. All it should receive benefits are respect of whether they are in an urban area, near an urban area, or there's no urban at all in their area. So we are very much uh, committed to doing that. Um, there are always the challenges of trying to make sure... and. and in some respects, I don't envy Keith the role, because whenever you speak to a local authority, they want pretty much everything that Keith's got and very little that the UK government would normally spend into. And that can be a big challenge, because it isn't easy, therefore, to have a local authority say, well, we want 100% spending in the devolved area, but we can't think of anything to ask the UK government for. And that can be one of our challenges, to try and encourage them to see where some of these areas can be developed that would allow us, the UK government, to act and to spend and trying to find the 50-50 in some of those areas again, where broadly 100% of the ask is all devolved, is not that straightforward, and it has caused tangles in the past. I think going forward, though, um, Keith and I will need to sit down and work out how to do it, because we don't want to be tangling each other up in complexities, uh, and we don't want to overpromise because we are working within budgets which are ever-tightening, but equally we want to make sure that no part of Scotland is left behind, and that all can see prospects coming, albeit that little bit further away. Identified that we are a, a nation of cities, but we're also a nation of towns, uh, and we have we have different aspects, and, and they have different aspirations as to what they want to try and achieve. Uh, and the the role of the Scottish government is vitally important here, but the role of the UK government is also vitally important to ensure that everybody feels that they are being supported. Now we've we've touched on before where communities have felt that they've not always been included, uh, and and you've indicated, Camp Secretary, that it's local government that should do that, but some of that involvement uh, has meant that they really have been left outside uh, and really felt that they've been left outside because the bigger, more ambitious, more uh, prospect pro projects that the council may have identified uh, are the ones that they want to see happen. Uh, and the ones that, that are in the hinterlands or that are not quite, quite other or may come later on in the 20-year programme uh, maybe what sees to happen. But at the, at the moment, as I say, you need to identify that. So I would encourage and I hope that we do see convener uh, a, 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 a joined-up process going forward to ensure that we do have that balance uh, so that we don't end up with people feeling that they are uh, excluded or left behind in this whole process. I think that, that might be more, more of a comment. Yep. Mr Gibson, I'm going to bring in in just a second, but i just, just briefly clarify something you said, Lord Duncan. You did say we'll have to wait to see what the Chancellor says today, whether your asks have been delivered. Does, does, does that mean you have had a key ask in relation to city region deals in relation to Scotland for the budget today? Well, what we've done is we're hoping to see priorities set. We have at the moment uh, the quantum to take forward the, the city deals that we've outlined. We're hoping now to see be ourselves being able to move forward. Uh, and we have, in order to deliver against the growth deals in Ayrshire, in Murray, 
uh, and indeed in Falkirk and elsewhere, we are always asking to get money. It's a question of when we get it, which is a challenge. Now, I'd like to be able to tell you the answer to that question in a, in a more declarative way, but I can't. That's a very eloquent way of just saying yes to my question, Lord Duncan. You might um, well say that. And, and <laughs> can, and can, I, can, I, can I just check? You mentioned issues with local authorities being able to find that 50-50 split between Scotland and UK government in relation to reserve devolved and getting maximising the, oppor the financial opportunities from both governments. Would that not strengthen the case should you be prepared to make it, along with this committee, if that's what we decide, that at some point money should not lose its, lose its traceability but should lose its identity and have a more kind of collective, holistic view on how we invest in city region deals rather than devolved and reserved? because you've identified, I think, yourself in your evidence that there are issues sometimes with local authorities identifying what the UK government investment would look like in their area. It's still the same as it was before. Um, when we identify projects in the reserve space, they are very clear uh, and very clearly delineated, and we are therefore able to justify the spend when we approach the Treasury to deliver against that. What we're unable to do, however, is to commit spending into what, in effect, would be the devolved space. The Treasury would argue that through the block grant, they are already funding that and will not double fund it. Now, that might seem a very um, uh, unhelpful statement to make, but at the same time, it is uh, the breakdown of how we spend the money and how we account for it. It's not unhelpful. Um, it, it, it's accurate in relation to Treasury position, but of course, the Scotland office might have a position which is maximising spend in Scotland for the benefit of Scotland, which might be different from the current Treasury criteria by which the Scotland office is applying city deal spend. So I'm just trying to create that space where some of this could change. I think the Cabinet Secretary wanted to come in on that. Yeah, just to say that um, um, we don't agree on everything. Um, the UK government does double spend. If you look at £1.5 billion pounds going to Northern Ireland, if you look at the fact that there's no requirement for match funding for city deals for Northern Ireland, if you look at the fact that uh, that £1.5 billion pounds is nearly entirely in the devolved space, of course the UK government dou double spends. And so I think the scope for the ask um, from the Scotland Office of the Treasury is pretty substantial. Many of these projects we could do far more if we were to have a pro rata equivalent of one and a half billion pounds to spend on devolved um, issues. So it is possible to do that. But um, I think the, the point about reserved issues is a really important one. I personally don't find it that difficult to think of things in the reserve space which would be very useful for local authorities. It should not be beyond them to come forward with those ideas. And the extent to which they don't means the quantum they get is reduced because if it's to be 50-50 and you only have a certain number of reserve projects and you only get so much. There is so much that can be done in terms of broadband, in terms of social security, a number of other issues. So local authorities, and the point that was made earlier on, it might be yourself, convener, that the process of city deals itself should lead to a dynamic which is not currently there, which leads people to think about transformational change, not all of which has to be funded by governments and others, that can lead to a transformative change. So it is that mindset that makes them think more broadly about it. Thank you. One of the challenges, I think, is when you go to a local authority or a local authority is exploring projects, inevitably they tend to be more around traditional spend by local authorities, and that then tends to fall into Keith's space less than mine. But once you can break through that mould and recognise where the UK government can spend, then you can see substantial uh, benefits. So when we look at the Aberdeen uh, example, where we look at the oil and gas technology centre, where both governments recognise the value in that and were able to commit to that very quickly, and indeed I think that's of all the city deals, that's the one which has perhaps hit the ground running and really kind of moved very quickly further forward. Um, the important thing, again, is that in the Northern Ireland question, there are uh, definitely challenges which we'll have to face uh, going forward, but none of them are centred around how the money itself will ultimately be spent. It's not our ambition here to um, place ourselves in a comparable situation. We will be spending, outside the Barnet consequentials, certainly at the moment, £1 billion uh, pounds will be spending considerably more to deliver against each of the existing city deals uh, and we will continue to spend more as we move from city deals to growth deals. So there will be a substantial amount of money being spent there. But the situation in Northern Ireland is um, different. I think that's a significant political debate which we will leave from this committee for the moment and we'll move on our line of questioning. Kenneth Gibson.
Thank you, Convere. Good morning, panel. Uh, Lord Duncan just said a few minutes ago that you believe that no part of Scotland should be left behind, but representing uh, one of the five air sure constituencies, I feel that we are being left behind, certainly in terms of uh, economic growth, per capita income, etc. Ayrshire is already behind, and yet there appears to be nothing on the horizon. I'll just quote from Patrick Wiggins, the director of the Ayrshire Growth Deal, uh, and is it from his evidence last week, which I'm sure you'll have seen, he says, and I quote, there is a commitment from the Scottish Government, but we are still pursuing formal commitment from the United Kingdom Government. Uh, we're making good progress with the Scottish Government and quite a lot of engagement with UK Government officials, but we really need a green light from the Treasury. So I'm just wondering why there's been such a delay in terms of Ayrshire, because uh, Edinburgh, which is much more prosperous, has got a deal, and um, from my perspective, looks as if it will go uh, the gap between, for example, um, Ayrshire and Lothians, and, and uh, Ayrshire will only grow. Um, and uh, I, I'm just wondering um, what the impact you feel this delay is going to have on a place like Ayrshire. There isn't a delay in that <coughs> sense because the commitment in the first instance between the two governments was to the city deals, and, and that is moving forward, and we will deliver each of those. Uh, within the, the, the schedule uh, we set. I would hope I would hope by the end of today you would be in a better place than you are right now. Well, I, I think I'm, I'm very pleased to hear that. I certainly hope we are because uh, I, the, the Chancellor made a lot of good noises about this uh, in January of this year and there was an expectation that was an announcement going to be made and no announcement was actually made. And I think uh, if there has to be um, a, a successful Im implementation of the issue of growth, we really need to know when it's going to commence what it's going to consist of and how it's actually going to be delivered. And I think there's real concerns that that's not uh, actually uh, going to happen. Um, now, just wondering um, um, how you feel areas, whether it's Ayrshire or somewhere else in Scotland, what the impact is in terms of displacement while other deals are going ahead. We've already heard that, that Glasgow had started in July 2014, even if Ayrshire is given the green light and maybe a number of months before it, it starts on the ground. And there is real concern uh, uh, that perhaps skilled workers have been drawn into other areas of Scotland where the deals are. Investment is being uh, drawn into places like Glasgow and Edinburgh. It might otherwise go to Ayrshire, Murray, uh, Galloway or whatever. So what, what, are, what concerns do you and indeed uh, the, the Cabinet Secretary have uh, with regard to this uneven development of deals? Well, I suspect that <clears throat> the deals themselves are not um, short term. So if you look at the Glasgow City deal, we're not expecting the deal to be completed in all its elements, uh, even in the first 15 years. We're looking at a much longer timescale. So I would have thought that within five years, if we're able to move forward from the city deals to the growth deals, again, over the same sort of time period, they will all be developing across Scotland, some faster than others because certain things can be delivered more quickly than others. But actually, you will begin to see all of them moving forward, uh, over that same 15, 20 year period. So there shouldn't be quite the displacement. And looking at, for example, the, the, the Glasgow deal, so the, the UK commitment there was half a billion pounds. The spend is still on schedule, but actually the spend so far is actually quite modest uh, from our side. It's only around about 40 million pounds. So again, there isn't quite the distorting element of that, which I think might be uh, what you're fearful of. But what I would hope is if we're able to move forward and that the deals, and again this will be through collaboration with the Scottish Government and local authorities, uh, for us to move forward, we would hope that within, let's say within the next 10 years you would see all of the deals delivering, albeit at their own pace determined by the consortium which um, pulled it together. So, and, and that's why I, I think the deals should be almost the gift that keeps on giving, if that doesn't sound an odd way of putting it, because it should be over such, that, such a lengthy period of time. I think uh, Gibson's right, we can't stand still and wait for a deal to be done. So we have been active uh, in the space and perhaps not in the way that you would be if you had a joined up um, growth deal in the way we've described. But for example, I think it's 800 modern apprenticeships we've um, seen uh, created in, I think it's North, uh, North Ayrshire alone over the past four years. We have supported um, Spirit Aerosystems near the Presswick uh, Airport, again with investment there to try and uh, R&D investment to try and bolster employment there. And the most recent announcement would be the £5.3 million pounds that we put into the HALO project in Kilmarnock. Um, now, that actually is a very good example of just what's been asked about. That project could have been one where the two governments worked together in relation to that and said we saw 
Well, we saw what we saw. So an early announcement from the UK government subject to due diligence. I haven't seen an announcement like that before. Um, and we announced the £5.3 million. Pounds. If we'd approached that together, and I'm encouraged by what Ian's saying, if he's saying that if we were to get better news or more confirmation of the UK government's approach uh, later on today, that will be a collaborative joint approach with the Scottish government, then that, I think, is encouraging. We have asked for that approach. We asked, I think it was last year when the councils collectively came to me from Ayrshire making the ask of me and I said, yes, we will do a, a growth deal. We'll do it jointly with the UK government if they want to do that. And they've been asking, and I've been asking the UK government um, ever since. Nevertheless, so I think in, in direct response to Kenneth Gibson's question, yes, we have to support the Ayrshires as best we can, but we should crack on and do a growth deal. If both governments can agree, we'll probably maximise the benefit we can get from that uh, and achieve something for the whole uh, of the Ayrshire. And in the meantime, it's worth pointing out that the councils in this regard have really taken the initiative by forming the Ayrshire Economic Partnership, which is unique uh, so far in Scotland, and a very encouraging sign of seeing how councils can work together and overcome some of the traditional demarcations for, for their mutual benefit. Yeah, I mean, one of the things you've touched on a couple of times, Cabinet Secretary, about deals being imposed, for example, rather than um, being agreed. Um, what impact do you think that actually has? I mean, if you're suddenly just told that there's a deal, you know, like, for example, in, in it, the initial one in Glasgow, and, now, and of course, things like the Halo Project, what impact do you have? Does that have, have a distortive effect in terms of um, the way the Scottish Government looks at these pro projects and deals and how it spends its, its capital? I don't think in relation to Ayrshire that is the case because there was quite a lot of discussion both with ourselves and the UK government about the things which the Ayrshire councils wanted to see developed. So the earliest discussion, I think, of a growth deal included the HALO project as part of it. So I don't think um, uh, that's being imposed. I, th I think it's been done in a disjointed way, which undermines uh, perhaps the full potential that we could realise if we did it in a more coordinated way. Now, it may be, um, notwithstanding what's been said, that the UK government decides it wants to provide support but not do it in conjunction with the Scottish government. That's fine as long as we know that. I, I don't think it's optimal, but um, that's fine as long as we know that. Um, but I, I don't think um, thus far that Ayrshire has suffered uh, from that. It's not been imposed. These things have been done... Well, the Spirit Air Systems was done at the request, obviously, of Spirit Air Systems for the wider benefit of the economy and the apprenticeships as part of our larger programme. But the HALO project was something which um, all the councils um, uh, spoke up for in relation to a growth deal. So I don't think anything's been imposed. The Glasgow deal was a different kettle of fish, uh, as you know. I think it is um, worth stressing that the Scottish Government will, of course, have obligations outside the city deals as part of their ongoing relationship with local government. So there will be, uh, rightly, uh, elements of, of spend and collaboration which sit outside. I think we can move forward, and the ambition that I was able to set out today is that we see the whole of Scotland covered by extensive city deals or indeed local deals or indeed island deals, depending on how they fit together. In terms of the HALO project, Again, we, the UK government moved quickly because they were seeking to secure private investment, which was, again, incumbent upon early movement. But the important thing, again, will be um, there will be no imposition of a deal on Ayrshire. Um, that's not in the gift of either government to achieve that, nor would it work. It will have to emerge, as with all of the other deals, from um, organic development of initiatives, buy-in from local communities, determination by the local authorities that the outcome is exactly what uh, the, the people and the, 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 the local authorities in that area want. So there will, all we can look at at this point is to make sure that the green light can be given to the initiative so that we can then begin the process of determining our commitment levels to that where we see we've got funding uh, in place, we're able to move forward. Ian, just, just one final point, Convener. Um, one of the things about the deals, obviously, which makes them so attractive is um, the ability to lever in private funding. Um, the Glasgow deal, for example, is looking to lever in some $3.3 billion over 20 years. Um, so far, although it we're still early stages, only three years in, um, are we seeing that leverage um, in the kind of, you know, are we seeing more, less of than we expected, or is it on track? I think in relation to Glasgow, uh, they estimate um, a contribution from the private sector of, I think, £3.3 .3 billion, pounds, I think was their estimate. But I think it is probably too early to say. I, I do know that in relation to the Aberdeen City deal, we're talking about £400 million pounds of investment just in terms of the Aberdeen Harbour, and that is on track. It's following a process, and that's on track to do that. I think, though, it's worth um, just addressing the point about private sector investment. This is something that we have uh, struggled with um, 
Edinburgh, both governments had to go back and say, you're going to have to do more work in terms of engagement with the private sector. And it is the case, and I, I know it sounds a, a little bit um, less substantial than saying, here's a cheque. If they do think about these things in a generally transformative way, and if they do think, sorry, I should say that Taste Cities and um, Stirling have done this quite effectively, I think, as well, talking to different partners in the private sector and some in the third sector, the ability to make it much more than it would otherwise be is dependent upon things like the private sector getting involved. So I, I don't know if the officials want to add to any early indications that we've got in terms of the Glasgow deal and private sector contribution. They have made a very substantial claim in terms of £3.3 billion. Pounds. Um, but uh, again, that was a deal that we uh, were only involved in towards the end. I don't know if there's anything else you want to say. But. Um, just to comment that uh, a point I think the committee has already considered is around a kind of monitoring and reporting on um, on city deals, and that's something that the uh, the group that um, uh, the cabinet secretary referred to earlier is is certainly looking at. Uh, it is quite early days in terms of um, demonstrating the. Uh, commitment and delivery from private sector partners across the city deals but uh, there is certainly evidence um, that, uh, that that's forthcoming uh, across the deals um, perhaps most evident in the uh, Aberdeen Aberdeenshire city deal where uh, um, the private sector are clear partners around uh, the table um, and it's something that we will certainly um, be uh, continuing to investigate and report on as we move forward. To, to, add, to add to that? Uh, no. Oh, that's fine. I'm just, just checking. I want to make sure because I'm not always going to identify when people want to come in and, and add something. So I just wanted to check. Yes, Lord Duncan. Uh, Aberdeen is a useful um, area to see where, um, beyond where the UK and Scottish governments have committed, you've seen significant commitments from other partners. So obviously the local authorities themselves have put in money, but you see substantial investment from the universities. Uh, Robert Gordon University and from Aberdeen University and we've seen that or are seeing that in the early stages again looking at the Stirling and Clackmannanshire deal we're seeing that again in the Tay Valley deal um, and beyond that there is a hope then that more monies will be unlocked as the wider private sector see the benefit of the particular initiatives and this comes back again to how the how the deals themselves the, how they are generated the genesis itself needs to have at the earliest possible stages how then shall we, in putting forward projects, unlock the monies that might potentially be out there from the private sector? And that won't always be possible, because in some instances, uh, certain areas will not have that level of private sector investment available. But where it can be done, the, the multiplier effect is very, very significant, and, and the output of that is, um, is useful to see, because it actually then brings together a certain coherence to the overall, uh, the overall drive behind the initiatives. Time is catching up with us. I've got two colleagues still wanting in. Okay, thanks, Mr. Gibson. Uh, Elaine Smith, MSP. Thanks, convener. Um, could I specifically ask Lord Duncan about what might be viewed as unintended consequences, just to explore a bit further what we've been talking about? And um, obviously, the the whole policy was originally introduced to create a northern powerhouse and to balance England's economy. So, I want to look at how that works exactly in Scotland and how there might be unintended consequences. Specifically, Alexander Stewart mentioned town centres because Scotland is obviously a country of towns. And so at the moment we have decline in some of our town centres. For example, in Lanarkshire, Coatbridge and Airdrie have been in decline for a number of years, the town centres. So I just wonder um, if you're confident that there is no risk that the city economies are going to expand to the detriment and displacement of town economies and therefore cause further damage to these town centres? Well, I think I can answer that. I'm fairly confident it won't. Because if, for example, we took the money in Glasgow, which is you know substantial sums of money, if that money was to be spent in one year, then I would argue you're absolutely right. The bonanza of that spend in one year would be such that you would see a distorting effect. But if you spend that money over 25 years, whilst at the same time in the areas that we're talking about, there are further growth deals as well, all overlapping against their own particular time frame, then I think the risk of distortion uh, is uh, cancelled out. 
Now, there will always be elements where uh, significant spend may draw in depending upon what the spend is in. So there's no question, for example, if the development in the oil and gas sector in Aberdeen will draw in people from that particular sector in that area. That, that will certainly be a distorting element as that begins to evolve. But at the same time, as the Tay Valley deal becomes a real uh, delivered uh, prospect and it evolves over a 10 and 15 year period, then you'll see that although they didn't start at the same time, within five years they will both be moving forward against their overall ambitions. So you would be quite confident, Lord Duncan, that there isn't any fundamental flaw in the, the whole um, the whole project and policy because of the way it was created. There's no fundamental flaw in that and over the longer time frame you would be confident that there wouldn't be detriment to the hinterland, as you call it. Well, I'm being very careful in the words I use. When I talk about the cities, often the city deals themselves have a city and region element, so that is their hinterland. No, I would be fairly confident that there shouldn't be a distortion. I think there would be if both governments spent a vast sum of money very, very quickly, but we're not proposing to do that. It will be over uh, a generation or longer in some instances, and you will see that spend, therefore, begin to be married up. Now, some particular projects will move faster. We saw the oil and gas technology centre in Aberdeen. City do move very, very quickly. Um, other elements will be, by their nature, determined to be on a slower spend level. So a number of the projects within the Glasgow City deal are actually paced over a much longer time scale. So I think both governments are conscious of these elements. So it, would be, it would be unfair for me to dismiss them as without um, worthy of consideration, but I don't think they are a fundamental flaw. I think they are just a recognised element of the evolving city deal landscape. And as uh, Mr Stewart points out, again, we can leave behind none of the, the, the non-urban uh, hearted uh, areas, and they will move forward at a pace which, again, will be quite distinct uh, as well. Importantly, we would hope that by the end of the decade we will see all of the parts of Scotland and one would argue uh, Northern England also experiencing exactly the same approach so that there is um, a city landscape and an evolving growth landscape uh, that should be transformative. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, do you want don't feel the need to add something to it, but do you want to add to any of that? Just very briefly to say, I think Elaine Smith hits on a, a, an important point here. Um, it's worth pointing out that the city region deals um, will themselves cover quite a large number of towns as well as cities. Uh, but we think it's right that all parts of Scotland should benefit from this. And I think there is a, a, a fear. Uh, if, and we just don't have clarity on this yet, if the UK government pro proposes to um, take this forward in the context of the industrial strategy, that, I think, was born of the Northern Powerhouse idea, as is mentioned. And the Northern Powerhouse idea was about the imbalance in the UK economy, especially in relation to Northern England, a uh, very important thing. Some of the early signs that we are seeing with the first wave and second wave of funding for those is it seems to be reinforcing that inequality um, because it's easier sometimes, a point made earlier on, uh, to fund things where there's very um, dynamic economic activity always already happening. And I have made the point as recently as last week to Greg Clark, the Secretary of State, that if it's going to succeed, the industrial strategy has to tackle that. It can't just reflect it. So we've seen a, a lower percentage of bids coming forward or being approved from Scotland, from Northern Ireland, from Wales and from Northern England. If it simply reinforces current uh, inequality, it is not going to have served its purpose. I don't think that's the UK government's purpose. And to be fair to Greg Clark, he said it absolutely, absolutely is not. But if that's to be achieved, and it means the pursuit of the industrial strategy, if that's the means by which the UK government proceeds, is going to have to actively help those areas to come forward with bids and make sure that economic activity takes place. I think that's very helpful. Lord Duncan, I, I just, just before you answer this, it, I apologise that I'm going to ask for brevity, but I understand you might want to outline in more detail how industrial strategy may be set beside inclusive growth and all those things the Cabinet Secretary is talking about, which you can perhaps correspond with us in relation to Lord Duncan? Oh, I can be very, very brief. Um, okay. The industrial strategy is not driving forward the uh, the growth deals. So that's actually quite a simple answer. And in truth, um, when you look at some of the, the, the deals which are emerging in England, for example, the, 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 the Cornish deal is not in any way determined by the growth strategy. So there is no... There will be overlap, inevitably, just as there will be with some of the existing city deals, but they're not, they're not linked and it's not a driven uh, force. OK, that's very helpful, Elaine Smith. Yeah, no, that's fine. Okay, Andy White. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. Um, I've got a substantive question, but just a, a brief... Um, for clarity, uh, 
uh, Mr Duncan, you talked about a move from city deals to growth deals. Do, do you mean by that that the ones that are filling in the current gaps are going to be called growth deals because there's no cities in them? Or do you mean that growth deals is a, a, a new way of doing business which may well come forward in some kind of phase two on, in, in areas that already have city deals? No, I, I'm, I'm being very clear. Broadly, we've run out of cities. We've Sorry? broadly run out of cities. So um, we need to then allow the same... Oh, sorry, no, I, I, I wasn't trying to be clever. I just mean that we, we will have completed broadly all of the bits of Scotland which have in them a, 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 an urban conurbation. And we, if we're moving forward with the same initiative, the same idea, then we, we really need to call them something different. But, so, so it's, it's filling in the gaps. perhaps more than it is, um, than it is anything else. So we're, we're not, I'm not trying to be clever. I'm just trying okay. to... And, and so the point about this is where Keith and I hope we'll sit down again is to try and see how... Because in the initial approach, it was to look at city deals. That was the original plan. Um, but clearly, when that's evolved, and we do need to recognise, and it has been confirmed, I think, from a number of the participants, that Scotland is not just about cities. So um, we need to find the way of taking the initiative and the idea and recognising that these growth deals, by their nature, will be different because they will not have at their heart a large urban conurbation. They will. That's, that's helpful. Yeah. Thanks. Um, on the substantive point... Um, Glasgow is obviously the, the first one, and as, as I understand, it has a five-year gateway uh, review, which is shortly uh, coming up. Given that these city-region deals are for 20 or 25 years, you talk about them being generational, during which uh, governments change, um, during which big things will happen, like leaving the European Union, and new policies will emerge, like industrial strategies and, and whatever. I mean, how can this be monitored in a sensible way when in 10, 15 years' time, we'll be in a very, very different place with possibly very, very different governance arrangements in the UK. So that, um, the deals themselves are designed to have at their heart governance structures, which is part of the, the tripartite agreement, if you like. So irrespective of whether indeed one political party is in office north of the border, south of the border, or indeed if a local authority changes hands, the, the, the means by which we are able to measure are agreed and the governance structures and the review structures are all part of the ongoing process and part of the commitment. So I suppose it's not impossible that one partner uh, might have different views as we're seeing already in, in the Glasgow deal about how they might be refined or how they might be adjusted. But the structures in place for monitoring and oversight and so on, they're not really up for adjustment. They, they broadly are the fixed elements. The quantum itself is also fixed. It's the, um, in, in the case of the Glasgow situation, if there is indeed from the local authority level a determination to re-examine elements, then I think both Keith and I would be responsive uh, to that, but we're not seeking to change it. The structures need to be trustworthy so that everyone within it is able to operate on that uh, fair and level playing field. It's fair to say there are not many structures in governance in areas like this that extend for 20 years. That is very unusual, uh, that, that are not, for example, underpinned by primary statutes. I mean, I'm just, I mean, how confident are you that if we see problems arising in an Edinburgh or Aberdeen deal or whatever in, in 10 years' time, that the governance structure will, will be adequate to dealing with it when the original players have long gone, when the policy context may be very different? I would argue that if we put in place the right structures, uh, that should be able to weather the, the, the political changes that come along. There are, of course, entirely unknown unknowns which could change the entire landscape. I'm, I'm aware of that, but I, I think we can only work on the basis of constructing robust uh, governance, robust auditing. That's all we can do at the outset, and that's what we have, I think, done through each of the deals so far. They are underpinned by the commitments of our respective governments and by the local authorities, recognising, of course, that the parties in power in any of those particular tiers need not be the same, but the commitment should remain the same going forward because that is how um, large-scale projects are built over long periods of time. Uh, Secretary, without speculating on the unknown unknowns, are you confident that the structures will prevail irrespective of political change or the, you know, the new, new thinking in relation to economic industrial strategies? I'm not sure that the assurance sought by Andy Whiteman can be achieved by putting in structural uh, or infrastructure which allows that. I think it's much more um, to do with how they're baked in at the start. So the points that have been made by other members in terms of popular support for them, engagement with communities. Um, I thought also within local authorities that they have an inclusive approach amongst all the different parties and that would help to 
I can't guarantee it, but it would help to obviate uh, swifts and uh, swings in policy and, and priorities that would then make a previously agreed project um, um, non-sustainable. So I think I mean, nothing certain in life. I think local authorities do change hands, governments change. I think from both governments' point of view, we put in to our long-term budget projections a commitment to these city deals. Uh, it's not um, done on a on a whim that will be uh, changed um, in, in that way. It's, it's a long-term commitment we made. But things things can change, things will change, and sometimes it's good that we can reflect those changes and the priorities that we have. But the more in which there's agreement at the start and consensus and inclusion involvement in it, then the more chance it's got of sustaining um, some unforeseen events, even such as uh, Brexit. Andy Whiteman. Thank you. Thank you. We're now out of time, but just I want to make sure we have a balance of evidence here. And there's one or two things I'd like to kind of mop up on before we close the evidence session. So perhaps, even though there might be substantive questions, some brief observations and perhaps correspond with the committee clerks for more information would be would be very helpful. I thought our Deputy Commissioner Elaine Smith made a very interesting point in relation to how towns fare in relation to this, which we did have a question we are hoping to ask around uh, how these city region deals or growth deals take account of equalities and sustainability and I thought that that was relevant at, at that point as well so that's not just equalities in terms of geographical but you know different sections of the community so what checks and balances are there within these these projects that are go through city region deals like equality impact assessments that kind of thing what due diligence in relation to that kind of area happens with city region deals The officials can confirm that we are undertaking equality impact assessments on the city region deals that were taken forward. Now, that wasn't true in the early days. Um, I, I mentioned the circumstances, for example, in relation to Glasgow. I, I think the one thing I would say in relation to this, we do want to, we have our priorities, inclusive growth and increasing equality is very important, but we don't want to continually overlay our um, criteria on top of what local authorities are coming forward with. So it's an important forum this to put the message out there that for those seeking to do city deals, things which reflect those priorities in terms of inclusive growth, uh, improving uh, equality, are things which we are going to prioritise. But uh, local authorities also have got a role to play in this. Okay, Lord Duncan, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, um, yes, I mean, broadly speaking, we would be in a comparable situation. Uh, we have, as a government, uh, a number of determining factors and around the equalities agenda uh, in terms of fairness, in terms of dignity and uh, so forth. But we also recognise that much of the responsibility there is for the constructors of the projects themselves to be building in with the bricks these elements and we seek throughout the process assurances that that is indeed the case. Uh, and that's not to say we solely rely upon that, we need to also audit that to make sure that they are delivering against both government's expectations in this wider, um, this wider area. Thank you. Um, another thing, members have kind of hinted at it and we're lines of questioning. This is funding over a long period of time. We know Glasgow City Region deal will have a gateway review, but other forms of monitoring of, of the other deals in relation to meeting outcomes uh, in, in relation to an agreed framework. What happens if, if they fail? What happens to that guaranteed long-term funding? Is it no longer guaranteed? What's plan B? Cabinet Secretary. We could uh, just to go back for a second, if I could quickly convene it to the point about equalities. You'll be aware, of course, that uh, local authorities have got statutory responsibilities in relation to that as well. So that has to be something that they factor. That's probably how we would ensure what's coming forward um, meets those uh, equality impact assessments. Uh, in relation to if something fails, and I think that's a pretty um, big message about people should pause and take stock of where they're going. And I think if we we haven't had a failure in relation to the Glasgow City deal, but we have had, um, it seems, uh, a demand to have things looked at again. And it seems to me right to be able to do that. So the process has to allow for that. And if it's something that fails a gateway, the gateways are there for a purpose to make sure that the, the project, if it's a project, is sustainable and it meets objective criteria for that. So I think it's right that that process is there and it will force a rethink. So whether it's got to change the nature of the project, the extent of the project or... <laughs> Um, some other change, and it's right we should have that check and that balance in there. Lord Duncan, take a little second on that. Should local authorities be building r risk assessments into their city region deals on the basis for what their contingency would be if they didn't meet a gateway review or they didn't meet an outcome but wished to, d wished to proceed with a project nevertheless? Uh, just briefly, Cabinet Secretary, this apologies, Lord Duncan, will take you in after that. Uh, well, I think uh, everybody involved in the process should be undertaking their own risk assessments, and local authorities be no different. 
Okay, thank you, Lord Duncan. No, I, I, absolutely. The, what we're seeing just now is that we, we shouldn't be waiting five years to discover that something has gone wrong. So the point is that the ongoing auditing and the ongoing assessment should be enough uh, to safeguard against failure. That, that has to be at its heart. And again, if that can be anticipated, if there is indeed a problem which is emerging, then it's incumbent on those who are leading the projects to work very carefully to avoid failure, because there's n at no point does either government wish to be in a situation in which significant inv investment is lost because a project could not fulfil its initial obligations. That being said, all participants must look at the risk uh, register that they have to make sure that they are prepared for any, ev ev any eventuality in that regard. And that needs to be built in with the same uh, elements as we touched on a moment ago in terms of equality. They need to be the component parts of the, the overarching projects and they need to be monitored carefully to ensure that they don't drift from that. I think what we're seeing in Glasgow, and this perhaps comes back to what Mr Whiteman was talking about, there is an evolution uh, in this situation and we're seeing it in Glasgow already that um, there are some views from the, the, the local authorities that some of these areas should be re-examined and we are not deaf to that. It's a question of how we do so in a sensitive way that, that doesn't cause... Uh, by trying to solve one part of an equation, we end up con uh, contorting the other part. OK, now, final question, probably more relevant for the Cabinet Secretary. It's one of these things where you ask a substantive question at the very end of an evidence session, so maybe a, a brief comment, and if you could come back to us with a, a more detailed answer if you think it's required, Cabinet Secretary. There's a, Scotland's like a big jigsaw at the moment where we're plugging in city region deals, growth deals, with questions about bits that have been missed out and late to the table, is there displacement? We've asked all those kind of questions, but given the fact that um, there's a focus in regional partnerships within the forthcoming Enterprise and Skills Review, is time now right for a more coordinated Scottish-wide regional economic strategy and monitoring programme or is the opportunity around all this to better plug in different parts of Scotland to feed in from local authorities up to what that national economic and skills strategy might be and how would the Scottish Government maybe see that going forward? Uh, I think it's a very good question which it would be useful to follow up in writing but my immediate thoughts on it are that we have sought to um, establish just that through the Enterprise and Skills Review with the establishment of the Strategic Board if you look, so you've got that at a national level, if you look at a local level to what Ayrshire are doing in terms of the economic partnership they've established, that reflects, I think, their priorities and a way of working with the other um, players in the Scottish uh, area. So we are open to the idea, for example, in relation to skills and some local economic development to see if we can try and bring that together in just the way that you describe. So that's a process we're involved in. It probably had to be done with the Enterprise and Skills Review happening first. And just uh, another point on the nature of the city region deals. They have happened relatively organically and I don't think that's a bad thing. But it is the case, as a number of panel um, committee members have said, that there's a, you called it a jigsaw approach. I think we've had a little bit more clarity today from the UK government. This is news to me that the industrial strategy is not to be used as part of the growth deals. And the only reason they're called growth deals is because Ayrshire termed itself as a growth deal and Murray has done the same. We're not insisting on this, um, uh, this terminology. It's something which has come from the local authorities. And that's a really important point. There is something organic in city deals, which I think makes them sustainable if they are properly reflective of local communities. So whilst we do want to coordinate, just in relation to the question you asked, Convener, to coordinate and make sure that each part of the jigsaw puzzle knows what's happening elsewhere, I think we also have to allow for some element of dynamism and uh, organic um, growth and local initiative as well. OK, that's helpful. Lord Duncan, I think it's reasonable to bring you in at this point. Yes. Well, just a very brief comment, just again, helpful clarification for, for um, Keith. The industrial strategy will um, overlap with elements of the, the growth deals and the city deals, but to be very clear, it will not be the driver of them. OK, thank you. Well, well, time is upon us. Can I thank uh, all our witnesses today for, for their efforts? efforts? We're delighted to hear that there would appear to be movement today uh, by the Chancellor in relation to city, region or, or growth deals. I'd like to think that uh, the Chancellor is, of course, watching the work of this committee, Lord Duncan, in relation to that. And Lord Duncan and the Chancellor remain open-minded to the reporting and recommendations of this committee, indeed the Scottish Government also. So thank you very much, everyone, and we'll suspend briefly. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back. We now move to agenda item two, which is draft budget scrutiny 2018-19. Uh, so the committee will take evidence in the Scottish Government's draft budget for the said year. And can I welcome Councillor Gail McGregor, spokesperson for resources, and Vicky Bibby, Chief Officer, Local Government Finance, COSLA, and Paul Dewey, Director, Shared Services, the Improvement Service. Uh, can I thank you all for, for coming along? We've got a couple of open statements, like the first is from Councillor McGregor. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, well, Graham assured me that you were a, a kind bunch and you would be gentle with me on my first time giving evidence, so I will hold him to that later. Um, but thank you very much for inviting me along to give evidence uh, in the run-up to the forthcoming budget. Obviously, it's a very difficult time for local authorities, and this issue is of great importance not only to me um, in my role as Cosla Resources spokesperson, but also as a councillor, and most importantly as a citizen, um, as a member of the public. Um, <laughs> It's absolutely essential that we recognise the essential services that local government provides to communities right across Scotland. And I'm, I'm aware that many of you in this room have been councillors before, so you've been at the hard end, you understand the um, challenges that we, we do face. Now, we have, we've produced a document, Fair Funding for Essential Services, and the key message that we set out in the written evidence, which I think you have a copy of, is wider lobbying around this year's spending review. We're here to, to champion local services and, and hopefully gain some support from you and work together with local government and the Scottish government. Um, I very much welcome the discussion today and offer any information and evidence that I can. I'm quite new to this role, so I may defer to Vicky on occasion when it gets very technical, um, but she, she'll keep me right. Now, we obviously recognise the tight financial environment that we're in, and we'll get the details of the Scottish budget later on today, once the Chancellor has made his statement. However, if we're really serious about tackling inequalities in Scotland and promoting inclusive growth, then we must have a properly resourced local government to deliver the essential services we have set out in our document. Lastly, there are big challenges ahead. As I say, we must all work together, but we're facing pay inflation and ever-increasing demand for services. Reduced funding is a reality, we know that. Restrictions on local taxation is still an issue for local government. And, and how we tackle that and remain sustainable is going to be a massive challenge. It's exacerbated in the short term with one-year budgeting. Um, gone are the good old days of two- and three-year budgeting, and I, and I think that one of the big challenges that we have now is working from year to year. So I welcome today's discussions in the hope that 2018-19 can address some of the issues that I've raised. Thank you very much, Councillor McGregor and uh, Paul Dewey. Again, thank you for the welcome. Thank you for the opportunity to participate. Um, in terms of the written evidence we provided, uh, I think we've set out a lot of what has been echoed in what other councils and COSL have said in their submission. Um, I suppose what I want to draw on as part of this conversation is a whole range of resources that are showing how local government is responding, the types of things that they're doing. Um, and I suppose there is still scope for further improvement, uh, innovation, um, and a number of the councils particularly highlighted their work on the digital side and how we might prosper in a digital world, both in terms of internal and external self-service, but also how we engage with communities differently and also how we make best use of the assets that we have. I suppose what that really begins to highlight is that um, in the submissions, people refer to how sustainable are those approaches. And for us, I suppose, as the improvement services, that whilst we do believe, yes, there is opportunity with service redesign and transformation, but that requires leadership, it requires uh, uh, capacity in people, and it requires investment. Um, and the last five years have seen a significant flattening of structures, broadening of management portfolios. Um, and therefore, that does give issues around sustainability and resilience, particularly in unprotected and, and corporate services, as highlighted in a number of submissions. And local government has done things like, for example, collaborating around creating some shared capacity like the digital office, work on the roads collaboration, the Northern Alliance and things like that. But again, all of those take time to, to lead, to put in place and require upfront investment. Um, and that can be hard when short term deficits have to be met and budgets have to be balanced now. And then finally, I think we, we highlighted that alongside the scope for improvement and the scope for innovation. 
um, that really trying to uh, get to a position where local government has true flexibility and the ability, uh, as highlighted in the Commission for Strengthening Local Democracy, um, the opportunity to bring uh, fiscal capacity and a range of additional fiscal uh, capabilities to local government so that we can have truly local choices. Um, so, thank you. Thank you very much for those opening statements. We'll move to our first question from Graham Simpson. Thanks, Convener, um, and thanks for coming. Um, so, lo local government has, uh, for many years, complained that it hasn't uh, got enough money uh, from central government. Uh, and this year, um, you're, you're arguing that uh, you'd need a, a revenue inf in increase of £545 million pounds just to stand still. Um, can you perhaps explain to us um, what that figure is based on? Oh. Oh. <laughs> this is quite unusual for me. Coastal I mean, McGregor. Uh, sorry? So the Coastal McGregor, on you go. I know, it's broke. Um, I, th I think the reality is that, as you know, local government does feel that it's been the, the sort of poor cousin of the, the of the public sector arena. And certainly, as, we're, as we've moved over the past few years and we've reached a stage with budget cuts, um, we've reached a pressure point. I think the reality of the half a billion pounds that's required just to stand still is, is sort of encapsulated within your inflation rate at 3% and then your additional demand-led services, which we're finding increasingly difficult to deliver with the budget that we have um, and the pressures that come with that. There may be a more technical answer that Vicky might want to bring in, but I think certainly inflation is the, bit, you know, the main factor. And then secondly, the, the demand-led services such as care at home, um, childcare and the such like that, that we're having to deal with. And if we don't get additional funding for that, then we are going to be in a very difficult position. Okay, thank you. Vicky, did you want to add to that? Um, yeah, just to um, highlight how the, the 545 million is made up. Um, as Councillor McGregor says, yes, um, half of it, well, sort of just under 300 million is based around inflation, um, but 250 million of it is based on demand. We've worked very closely with the Improvement Service and the economists and the statisticians to look at trend data and build up quite a... Um, um, substantial um, forecasting piece of work that we've worked with directors of finance and this model's been in place since 2012 when COSLA um, did their work around the, the SFRG model that um, produced the gap and we've been updating that um, every year hi to really highlight the demand for services continuing. Um, I don't think it's explicitly we're, we're um, calling for an extra half a billion. I think the, the purpose of, in the submission was to highlight just to continue what we're doing at the moment to deliver services the way local government is delivering at the moment would require an extra half a billion. And I think it's in recognition that that just as a starting point, is a budget gap for local authorities to look at to, through, um, to um, address through efficiencies transformation just at the starting point for a year. Paul Dowie, did you wish to add anything? No. Liam Simpson. Yeah, I'm a little bit confused by that. Um, you're, you're saying you want no more cuts to the revenue settlement, um, but in order to have no more cuts, i.e. to stand still, you, you need an increase, and you've just said you're not calling for that. So, wh which, which is it? Uh, I think we're we're calling for a fair settlement um, for for the revenue settlement um, for local government, and um, I think what we're trying to say is that before any cuts in a settlement, local government is wrestling with a half a billion funding gap. So, what would you regard as a fair settlement? Funded budget. <laughs> is that half a billion pounds extra? I would say in the perfect world, yes. Uh, and we'll come to the other challenges that, that we're going to face that if we don't have additional funding within the budget, um, it's going to cause massive pressures in other areas. But we'll oh. maybe come to that later on in the session. Yeah. Okay. Um, in both submissions, um, you both refer to uh, the restrictions on spending. Uh, Cosley, you say 58% of Council's budgets uh, cannot be reduced. Um, I think the Improvement Service has the figure at uh, over 60%. Um, but you're making the same point that there are restrictions on uh, what councils can spend. Um, so in Coswell's submission, you say that 
just 42% um, of the budget uh, has to absorb cuts, uh, which means an 8% cut uh, in resources results in a 20% cut in services. Um, do, do you think um, there should be fewer restrictions on spending? It's a trust between local government and the Scottish government. Um, I've been involved in some very uh, good discussions with Derek Mackay recently, and I, and I thank him for that. And we've had some very frank and open conversations about trust and, and what they will allow local government to take a little bit more control over. Um, I think historically the issue has been that we, we've ended up with an awful lot of over-and-above initiatives that aren't contained within the core, and that's led to the, the imbalance with your 58% your being controlled now with sanctions or other stipulations. Um, I think there are many things within the budget that could have caps removed or sanctions removed and a little bit more trust with local authorities. We're all in it for the same thing. We're not here to cut services. We don't want to lose staff. We want to empower our staff. We want to provide better services for, for, for the public. And I believe that the Scottish Government wants that as well. But while we have these sanctions in place and, and priorities of the government, which doesn't allow us to play with our budget a little bit more, then I, I feel that we have sort of reached a level where they, they no longer trust us to deliver what we know we should be delivering. And I think, I think that's a fairly important message to get across, that discussions are there and they're very positive, but actions are going to speak louder than words. And I, and I think that they need to give us just a, a wee bit more autonomy back to allow us to manage our budgets. Because as you say, it's 42% of the entire budget. It's almost, uh, you know, that we can play with. It's only a third within education. And that leaves you really, really strapped with the decisions that you can make when you're starting to look for efficiencies, as we said earlier. So I, I think it's a reality that great for BBC headline grabbing initiatives to be announced and absolutely fantastic, but it's us that has to bear the brunt of actually delivering that at the other end. It links to the transparency point that I think the committee has picked up in the past, and, and I think in the Glasgow submission it also talks about some of the less explicit impacts of, uh, of uh, the, some of the constraints, for example, around teachers and pay and things like that, so it's not just about major initi new initiatives and come in how they're funded, it is actually about uh, numbers of teachers and things like that to have an impact on the flexibility that councils have. Okay, thank you. Graham? Um, just... just uh, Final question from myself. Um, Mr Dowie, in your submission, you um, say that the total current spending by Scottish councils has reduced by 11% in real terms um, uh, over six years. Um, now, last, last year when we were doing this exercise, uh, one of our conclusions uh, was that there should be much greater transparency around the local government settlement. Um, you know, we, we struggled, frankly, to get straight answers uh, from any you know from anyone. The picture was confused. So, you know, what would you do to to make things clearer? For, well, for us, you and the general public. In terms of general settlement and what's happening with the budgets, aside from what individual councils are doing, and in terms of presenting their budgets and what's in their budgets and how the budgets are formed um, as part of. Uh, consultation exercise that they undertake at the moment. Um, the, I think there's a lot of work that's going on in that area, and I think there's also the work that we do at a national level, which is actually about a greater collaboration and sharing around how we construct uh, the profiles um, that are being used as part of the discussions we have today, and use that as common sets of assumptions that we use across the partners in local government. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I think local councils are actually very good at consulting with their, their local people now. I think we've, we've improved remarkably over the last five, seven years. Um, at local level, consultation goes out, usually pre-Christmas or pre-December. I think the difficulty that we have at the moment, particularly in respect of transparency for people like yourselves, is that we now have a late autumn statement from the UK government, which then impacts on the statement from the Scottish government. And where we were at 
perhaps three, four, five years ago, we were able to start to set budgets in December and, and almost have it tied down by February. We're now looking at that sort of trailing into the following year. And I think that that will cause a bit of a challenge for us in regards to transparency with yourselves. But I think certainly at local level, we're very, very good at consulting with the general public. We're just going to have to do it a little bit later and, and in a slightly tighter time frame than I think we've previously had to do. OK. Vicky Bibby, did you want to add to that? Really just that we're, we're um, the variations in the budget, it's whether you use the draft budget, the actual budget, but also the key thing for local governments um, and its core funding is the local government finance circular. And um, it is not easy to tally all of these things um, together, but I think we are working closely um, with SPICE, speaking with Scottish government officials to try and come up with a common set of presentation that will help everybody really understand the true picture. Mr. Simpson? No, I mean, that's, that's exactly what we were calling for, for last year, so let's, let's hope it happens. So, uh, in, in a moment, Kenneth Gibson, can I just say the £545 million pound first? Because one of the issues we had last year when we were trying to scrutinise budgets, um, some people were including monies transferred via health and social care integration, which was £250 million, pounds, as support for local government, half of which was for care sector wage pressures and the living wage, and other politicians were not counting that. Some politicians were counting support to local government to include PEF monies, for example. Others were not. And what we found was the numbers changed very quickly, depending on what monies uh, we were looking at. So the £545 million gap that COSLA would assert, and I, I'm not trying to undermine it in the slightest, I'm just trying to understand whether that would take into account monies via health and social care integration, monies via PEF, uh, council tax increases, that kind of thing, or is, that, is this a standstill £545 million based solely on the revenue grant? Understanding is it's based on the entire budget and, and on the assumption that everything that we're already doing requires mm. to continue, whether it be social okay. care or PEF or you know, any of these um, things that we've had to implement over the last two years. Assuming that they are going to continue as they are, this okay. is simply an inflationary and a demand-led increase. Okay, so the five. So no, it's, this is not including any additionals. This is just to, to to continue to deliver what we're doing. Right. So if you get every penny you got last year, you would need five hundred forty-five million pounds on top of that just to do the same again. Yes. Irrespective of where it comes from, just yes. that that that's what you would need. Does that include um, giving a view? terms wage rise to all your staff? Would that be part of the 545? Yeah. It includes the inflation rate, so that, that, that's taken into consideration the uplift in the living wage. And um, I mean, obviously, we're, we're going through some fairly extensive negotiations in respect of public sector pay cap being lifted and where we're going to go with that. Um, but I would say that, that most authorities have contingencies for a wage uplift at the 1% that we're at at the moment. And then as we move forward, we'll have to look at additional funding for a higher percentage. So yes. So is £545 million based on a 1% pay increase for all your employees? At this stage. It's, it, yeah. it's based on a general inflation rate of 3%. Right, so the £545 million is based on giving every worker in the local authority a 3% wage increase. Okay. I should try to drill down some of these figures. Yeah, that, I mean, that's we're, helpful. We're, we're giving the 1% at the moment, so the assumption is that that will maintain... But with, with going forward, we're aware that through negotiations and certainly with my employer's hat on, that we're looking at an inflationary uplift, but that's not agreed yet, but that has been factored in. And have you factored in the baselining of the health and social care integration monies you got last year? Or have you taken that back out again? Vicky? I, I think what this um, model is trying to illustrate is... It is, what it's doing is taking the current funding and saying if you apply inflation to that and the, the demand that we know from the modelling work, this is how much money you would need just to deliver what you're doing. So the um, £9,640 million it doesn't include that health and social care um, money. But what you would do is if you included that um, health and social care money, your starting point would be bigger. So your 3% applying and your 2.5% on demand would be bigger as well. So your end product would be bigger. I think it's an illustrative um, model to show actually the impact of inflation and demand pressures on the budget. Can, can I just, uh, Andy, I know you're being patient here and you're champing the bit to come in, but if it doesn't include 
the health and social care integration money that uh, integrated joint boards are spending pretty much on social service provision and wage pressures, then what you would do is you would take £250 million off that 545, wouldn't you? If that money goes back into the system again, which you've taken out. Um, no, you would add on... You would add the two hundred and fifty million onto the seventeen eighteen figure, so you would inflate that two hundred and fifty million by five point six percent and add that five point six percent of two hundred and fifty million onto your eighteen nineteen figure. So your five hundred and forty five million would actually be bigger. But that's baselined. We'll have we'll come back, we'll clarify yeah, that. I'm My happy understanding to. is that is now baselined into the settlement for local authorities, irrespective of the fact that it's transferred via the NHS. Yeah. Well, but we have taken the mm. local government finance circular, so that figure for the nine billion six hundred forty million, so that figure we've not included, so we've not inflated what would be required from for inflation on that figure. Right, I, I think this gets to the nub of the need for all the figures to be available at the same time and for transparency, because I'm sitting here going, I want to ask more questions, but I'm not sure if I'm right or wrong, Vicky Bibby, so I'm not going to ask any more. <laughs> OK, uh, Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. Um, I'm glad in response to Graeme Simpson's question about transparency um, that you're having productive discussions with Scottish Government and, and, and spiced about this because I think it's absolutely vital. It's a really, really important for the public to understand there is a settlement, local government settlement, what that is, um, and then there's health and social care money, etc. Et so I'm very encouraged by that and I really, really hope we can make progress this year. A um, number of substantive questions, but on the, on the actual... 545 million. I mean, just a, a question of fact. Your inflation rate of 3%, I mean, where, where does that 3% come from? Because normally you'd use a GDP deflator for broad costs in the economy. And that's 1.8%. I haven't looked at them, but they're less than, well, less than 3. So what's 3? CPI at the moment. CPI. So CPI is a consumer price index, the cost to consumers. That's not normally what's used to calculate the increased costs for public sector bodies. It's usually GDP deflators. Well, Am I um, not right? the GDP deflators, um, well, we'll look at RPI as well. RPI has historically been used, but um, recently over the last few years, um, there's been a shift in public um, calculations to use CPI more. Okay, let's get that clarified. That's for CPI. Um, actually, interesting, the um, improvement service um, paper, you, you, you refer to the fact the Accounts Commission um, we're forecasting 18% cut in real terms to local government over the next four years. And in um, the evidence from COSLA, I think, um, wishing Aberdeenshire Council uh, and others putting forward five-year projections in terms of their funding uh, over the next five years. That's against the backdrop of not having any formal multi-year funding settlement, um, but presumably that's based on Accounts Commission projections, as I've just indicated, Fraser Valander projections, this kind of thing. Is there not a danger that we get into a kind of self-reinforcing cycle where we're forecasting on the basis of declining budgets, so government cuts budgets? No, I think that was hard to do. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. But I think it is reflected in the Aberdeen share, and I think partly links to the discussion we've just had is about how do you get to a sharing of assumptions and having some common assumptions that everybody's working to would be good. I think in terms of how then this process and scrutiny process works in terms of making sure that we don't start accepting those assumptions and challenging those assumptions. So that actually the, date would hope, the debate would hopefully move to actually about those assumptions in the long-term planning will be as much as about what the individual year budget is. Okay, I mean, I mean, Cosler, you'd you'd like multi-year. I do. <laughs> yes, I mean, we've just had a session on city region yeah. uh, deals, uh, where being money's being put on the table, modest sums of money in the bigger scheme of things, but modest sums of money for twenty years, <laughs> um, and I think we heard from the cabinet secretary that that is factored into some kind of long-term budgeting commitments that bind future governments, which is which quite quite interesting. Um, I mean, how how important is that for local government in terms of planning and designing its services and changing its services, creating efficiency, etc., to deliver against projected demand increase against an uncertainty about how much resource is going to be there. I mean, how important is that multi-year for you? 
it's enormously important. I don't think it can be uh, stressed how important it is. Um, I think we would love to be in the position where we were guaranteed uh, some form of funding for, for big capital projects over a 25-year period. Um, I think the reality with local government is that um, due to the nature of services that we deliver, and, and they're very much revenue-based, um, that we've, we've seen the pinch we've had to... You know, we've had our efficiencies over the last 10 years. We're reaching a stage where I don't think efficiencies are going to be able to, to go much further. Um, and I think for us, what, Audit Scotland have come down quite hard on us um, in the recent past um, uh, you know, on our planning assumptions, and, and I think they're absolutely right to do so. In the ideal world, from a revenue and a capital perspective, um, I, I think we have to start, and again, it's collaborative. It has to be working with the Scottish Government and the UK Parliament to start to look at a better long-term vision, particularly in respect of things like social care, delivery of childcare. These are long-term projects, and we're working year on year on year, simply trying to just you know, keep our shoes clean. Uh, and uh, So I think it's incredibly important for us, but it's absolutely right that, that we look to the Fraser, you know, Fraser Rallander Institute um, to get good, independent, external advice to assist us. It's equally right that Audit Scotland comes down on us when we don't do it right, but we have to make it better. Okay. But that has to be done collaboratively. And I think it's not just infrastructure in that roads and, and bridges sense. It is actually the key point is to do with that the, the medium to longer term. We're going to shift to prevention if we're going to do that. That that just requires investment, and there's a there's an upfront cost in actually managing services as efficiently as we can today, whilst actually thinking about new approaches. And again, with shared services, if we want to collaborate more, if you want to change the nature of structures, that requires time and investment. And at the moment, without a, a longer term plan, how do you sensibly plan that you're going to get the return on those and be able to pay back the investments that you make, whether to make up reserves or whether to actually plug gaps in revenue and capital budgets in, in the future? So I think it is a broader yeah. approach that's required that looks at the full range of possibilities. Mm -hmm. And just, just, finally, sorry. just further to yeah. that, I, I think a good example would be something like you know, the, the People Equity Fund, um, which was given to us last year, and, and at that point was a sort of one-year um, system. We don't always look at the outcomes and what we're trying to deliver at the end. We, we, you know, we, we have initiatives like that. Now, we're not guaranteed that that funding will stay with us forever. I think we all want to look for better outcomes for, for pupils in schools that are struggling. I'm not convinced that perhaps that model was the best one, but that's the big discussion we have to have, because if we're going to improve pupil attainment, if we're going to bring kids out of situations which are very, very difficult for them, it has to be part of a wider family approach, not just a targeted fund like that. There may be better ways to do it. That's a discussion we have to have, but it can't be one year. Those kids aren't going to suddenly, miraculously, in a year's time, um, have fantastic outcomes. It's a really good initiative, it's a good idea, but it needs to have a five-year or a ten-year plan for it to actually work. And I think that's just a tiny, tiny little one that I would use as an example. Okay, and finally, I'm aware that other colleagues want to know a lot of questions, but very briefly, I mean, would, would you find it helpful to have um, a fiscal framework for local government that provides, in the sense that the UK Scottish have a, mm -hmm. governments have a fiscal framework that there's, there's rules mm -hmm. about the impact of spending, so we, we can at least know what happens when each party does something. I mean, would, would that be helpful? And how, how important is more fiscal autonomy? Um, answer to the first question, yes, absolutely. I think that would be very useful. And I, I think fiscal autonomy... <sighs> It's a very difficult one. Obviously, we believe that what we do at local level, it, it, you know, that we're the, the best people to determine what, how to do that. But that has to be done within a larger framework. I completely understand that. And this is why I say that we have to work with the Scottish Government and the UK Government. So I think autonomy is great, but it has to be under a wider... Um, much, I, I'm not entirely sure that local government has been given the credence that it deserves at times either. So, as I say, we do feel like the poor cousin, um, and perhaps we need to bolster our structures, and, and as you say, a, a fisc fiscal framework would certainly assist with that. Okay. Okay. Can I just check with the People Equity Fund? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, there were some nodding heads when I was ma making this comment to, to colleagues. Our understanding it is a multi-year uh, agreement. It's not. It's not one year. It will run for the lifetime of this parliament. For the so lifetime of this parliament. So, yes. So, I mean, you could contend that any government is only really in control for as long as they're. Mm -hmm. But the local government uh, controlling settlement the parliament. isn't for the so, length so, of this so parliament. How, so, the point. I suppose the point I was. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. But perhaps PEF monies was not the best example of that because mm -hmm. PEF is guaranteed for the lifetime of this parliament. I'm just wondering if the COSLA position might be that they think PEF is so significant. 
that this parliament should lock in PEF monies mm -hmm. for a decade or beyond and guarantee those monies straight to head teachers? Was that something that COSLA would be supportive of? No, no. I, I, I'm using it as an example of something that's been in, you know, introduced in the recent past um, and, and that we're very much in the early stages of, as you say, it's the life of the parliament, but our local government settlements go from year to year as well. Um, and, and if we're looking at longer term outcomes and targeting funding, which is absolutely essential to the most vulnerable people that we have in our communities, I think we have to look at a longer term approach because these kids aren't in school for for two or three years. They're in school for six years if they're in a secondary and seven years if they're in a primary. Their outcomes suddenly aren't going to turn over at night. So I think I mean, that, that, that was just one example of funding which is looking for a specific outcome. But how we get to that outcome, I think there needs to be wider discussion. And I think we have to have a discussion about whether it's working mm. under this structure or whether we mm. can be doing that one better. I know that was just supposed to be an illustrative example. Yeah, absolutely. But I'm just trying to infer pick, from your answer book. whether mm -hmm. or not you're supportive of the fact that that's a multi-year commitment from Scottish Government or not. PEF, is it, it something COSLA supports as a multi-year commitment from Scottish Government? Well, it's only within the life of this Parliament at the moment. But any so government it could only exists... Well, mm. well, let's not get to the realms yeah. of, of, of elections. So would you welcome, therefore, PEF being locked in for future Parliaments and a cross-party agreement in this place to lock that in for a decade, say? Money if to head teachers to, de to be deployed to tackle the poverty-related mm -hmm. attainment gap? Not necessarily, but I, I, I do think that what we do need is confirmation of future funding for these projects. Um, you know, they get put in and then they're not necessarily based, baseline for the following yeah. year and the year after that. But you've got it and for that's PEF, challenging. Councillor McGregor. That, the mm -hmm. point I'm <laughs> you, I'm going to, don't worry, I will move on, but you've got it for mm -hmm. PEF, Councillor McGregor. I think that's the point I was making. It was just one example. OK, yeah. that's fine. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll move on. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, convener. There's no doubt that, as you've indicated, local government has seen themselves as the poor relation over the last decade or so uh, in the funding that they've not received or they've asked. Uh, so when, when, when we sit and look at where we're going at present, we really are now looking at choices that are unavoidable uh, in, in making uh, uh, service uh, facilities reduce, reduced and in, in, in doing that. Uh, but every council has a, a plan, a financial plan, uh, a short-term, medium, long-term plan. Uh, Audit Scotland have then looked at some of those financial managements. And, and still within councils, uh, a large number of them don't get the strong financial management uh, tick from Audit Scotland. Uh, as you've indicated, sometimes they come down hard. Uh, and, and I think that's the reality uh, that we face ourselves in, at, at the present moment in time. So how can a council think about improving services rather than just maintaining services uh, if they don't have that strong financial management internally? Um, I think there is very strong um, financial management within councils. I don't think that's what Audit Scotland um, are asserting. I, I think in um, their overview reports of late, and there's one coming out very shortly yes. on local government, they've actually been very commendable of the management and of local authorities. What they have commented on is that there should be better longer term financial forecasting. And I think um, I think that's accepted, but um, I think it is difficult to do as highlighted by Councillor McGregor in the one year budgeting. And um, Audit Scotland are asking us, uh, asking local authorities to plan, to plan on a range of assumptions. Um, and to go out to budget consultation and a range of assumptions. And councils are increasingly increasingly doing that. But you can understand there's a whole host of scenarios and they all need to be resourced. And um, But I think that's the focus of what all Scotland are seeing in terms of improvement of... It's more around long-term financial f forecasting. I think they're um, very commendable of the financial management of local authorities and how they've um, managed to balance budgets in very diff difficult circumstances. And, and following on from that, the, the whole idea of contingency... Uh, and reserves within councils as to how they manage that going forward uh, because in the past that was what they tapped into to try and to alleviate some of the situations they found themselves that is now being eroded uh, and, they're, and they're left with very little maneuverment uh, so so where do you see this whole process going when there is no longer that maneuverment uh, and and they're attempting to look at a long-term financial plan management situation but they're not able to do that because they don't have the resource to manage it <laughs> no, I'm just 
defer to Councillor McGregor. Um, I think that's um, the case. Um, I know that reserves have been the subject of quite a lot of discussion with the committee in the past, and um, councils have used um, reserves to smooth budgets and invest in transformation um, programmes in recognition of where um, public finances on the whole have um, been going. But I think that's what we're trying to highlight um, in the submission. The local government has done a lot and managed um, um, with the, the finances as they are, but the um, sustainability of that is, is very much um, diminished and there's not as much scope to go. And I think from the upcoming overview of the report um, by Audit Scotland, which we published, it will be showing reserves going down. Okay. Thank you. I always want to come in. Uh, at some point, we're going to move on to look at the housing budget, but I want to kind of mop up all the various other things first. I'm at finances. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Gibson, then, yeah. Okay, thanks, convener. Um, I mean, one of the reasons why we, we don't have multi year budgets is because the Scottish Government doesn't really know for year to year what its own budget's going to be. I think that's a significant part. But I, I want to kick off just by a quote from the, the um, from Improvement Services, which I think is important to get in the record, which says that councils have achieved substantial improvements in efficiency, innovation, and productivity, while service output and outcomes have been maintained and improved. So I think there is a recognition that councils are doing a lot with less, but the, the conclusions of the improvement service are there are insufficient resources in the whole system to maintain current services and entitlements in line with demand. The Scottish budget has declined in real terms across the last five years and is currently projected to fall further. Now, given that consideration, I mean, how realistic is it uh, to, to actually suggest a, a sum uh, you know, as high as uh, £545 million, pounds, when we all know that the pressures in the NHS are actually growing faster than the pressures in local government, for example? I think you make a very good point. Um, I'm not going to get into any discussion over local government versus Scottish government versus UK government. Um, I, we are where we are. And, and I think this goes back to my point earlier on, that, and Andy picked up on it. We actually have to start to work more together and stop blaming each other more. Um, I, I think that would be very constructive. And in respect of, of budgets for the Scottish Government. I can't make any great comment on that. I'm here to represent COSLA. But I think the reality is that, and the Fraser of Allender have shown in, in a report fa fairly recently, that the Scottish Government has had increases in funding in real terms, um, whereas we haven't. You know, we've seen a decrease in our funding in real terms. And I, and I think that that's a reflection of the Scottish Government's priorities, and that's their decision to make. I'm here to fight for, this, for local government and to ensure that we get fair funding for local services and that we're able to continue to deliver what is absolutely vital to our communities. But as I say, I'm not going to get into any discussion about who does what to who. I, you know, I, I don't think that that's constructive. Well, I chaired the Finance Committee for five years, and one of the rules we always had is when someone said we should increase money, we always said, well, how should it be funded? Mm -hmm. And I think it's important if anyone comes to say, oh, just give us more money. But I think people have to say, well, we think it should be funded by A, higher taxation, mm -hmm. B, reducing funding, frankly, for other areas of Scottish Government and specifying what that should be. I think I think it, it's it's a bit hollow, really, to come and ask for additional funding, no mm -hmm. matter how sympathetic we are to that, unless you know there's 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 suggestions about how we should raise that money. Mm -hmm. where, where should that come from? Yeah, no, I completely appreciate that, and I think that's why COSLA has <coughs> has put in things and has a position on things like local taxation. It may not be um, terribly palatable to some politicians, and that's entirely okay. But I think that there's a, a recognition that that local government needs to be able to raise its own funding, and um, doesn't necessarily always have to look to national governments for funding. But if we have that level of autonomy um, to be able to put in a, a local tax of some sort or to be able to work with, you know, out with the cap that we have, then that would allow local authorities to take a little bit more responsibility for their own funding sources and maybe not have to always ask the Scottish Government. But, I mean, I understand that in, in, in terms of the settlement for the current financial year, eight local authorities, all, all, all Labour-led, yeah. incidentally, didn't even put the council tax up mm -hmm. at all after a nine-year freeze. So does that not make it difficult for COSLA to come here suggesting that the Scottish Government give additional funding when some of its member councils, even after mm -hmm. a nine-year freeze, aren't increasing council mm -hmm. tax? Just one other point on autonomy. I mean, I, I've, I, I've, I think the Concordat, the historic Concordat of 2007, as it was called at the time, uh, was a really important step in abolishing ring fencing. And I take your point that some ring fencing is crept back in. But COSLA itself have been a bit contradictory because you're effectively asking for ring fencing by suggesting in your submission that there's no more cuts to revenue settlement parity with cash increase for the Scottish Government, which would reduce the Scottish Government's own manoeuvrability. 
And I mean, the NHS, because of its uh, our ageing population, has increased its share under, dev in dev under devolution from 36 to 43 per cent of Scottish settlement. That, mm -hmm. would, that would, surely that would, that would, you know, you can't, in one way, you can't ask for us to, have, to reduce ring fencing. Or, or if you want, or, or the Scottish government seeing how money should be spent, when at the same time you're asking us, effectively, or the Scottish government to say, well, we should ring fence, you know, a chunk of um, of the Scottish budget at whatever the, the share is for local government at this point, you know. Yeah. Of course, and take the task for whatever you like. We're just <laughs> analysing those asks, no, those observations no, no, on that. No, it's absolutely reasonable as well. Um, yeah, as you said, there's quite a lot in there. I think. For us, it comes down to just having that additional flexibility within local government to make local decisions. We do have an awful lot of initiatives that are ring-fenced. Um, as you all know, teacher numbers, uh, you know, and such like. I'm not going to go through them. You know them all. Um, now, for local government, I, I don't know any government, I don't know any elected politician from any government that wants to sack teachers or do anything like that. We're here to deliver services and to empower our workforce, and I think that applies across the sector. What we don't have, though, is control over 58% of our budget. We don't have any say in what we do with nearly 58% of our budget. Now, some of it's statutory, of course it is, but some of it is ring fencing that was supposed to have been taken away some 10 years ago now, and actually that ring, that ring fencing has increased at the detriment of our core budget. Now, the core budget is the element that allows us to deliver employability and skills and to, to boost our local economy and to bring in you know, greater revenue opportunities and such like. These are the areas that could potentially get hit if we, can't, you know, if we are not able to make more autonomous decisions in other areas. The council tax, is, you know, I mean, there was only seven authorities that didn't move the council tax. I can't speak as to what they'll do this year. But again, we have huge disparity of council tax across Scotland because we have some local authorities who had quite rightly at the time um, kept the, the council tax levels very low. There was other authorities that put them up. When the freeze came into place, it put those who were on a very low rate at a huge disadvantage. So maybe we need to look at the, the cap and how that's delivered. And I think it's really, as I say, it comes down to trust and communication, which is what I'm engaging in with Scottish ministers and trying to find more resourceful solutions to ensure that local government gets a good settlement and that the Scottish Government can support us in that. Yeah, I completely agree. It was, it, it was definitely a lot of things. Uh, Mr Dowie, a chance to... Oh, sorry, apologies. <laughs> sorry, Mr Dowie. No, no. <laughs> no, no, I think it is the, the debate about what flexibility we need and get, having more or, or, or doing less in it and trying to make that a good discussion at a local level. But one of the places where that discussion can take place, I think, is through the community planning mm -hmm. side and all councils and partnerships have just created their local outcome improvement plans. Now, that isn't the total answer here, but that actually about how do we make better use of the shared resources we have at a local level in identifying some key priorities will at least be part of how we move that communication forward at a local level. So I don't think that's going to solve the problem, but I think it's it's the right direction and we're, we're getting to the point where we maybe get to some t tangible joint actions at more local areas. Across I do think that. that's fundamental. I mean, one, one of the, the issues, of course, is that the reason why ring fencing has increased from 2 to 10% is because the Scottish Government was had agreed with local government that it would provide additional money for things like free personal care, uh, teacher numbers, etc. Uh, and then this council's decided to spend it on something else. So so I think there was a, the, the trust element was kind of slightly lost there. Just, just um, in, in terms of uh, the point that Mr Dowie made, I mean, the Accounts Commission, obviously, we've had before this committee, and they've said that one of their concerns remains that even in local authorities have got very uh, um some are very similar um you know um to urban local authorities for example uh, there can be quite significant differentials in the cost of service delivery for something which looks very to the accounts commission looks very similar to and, and they've said that they don't un, they, they themselves are grappling with why we're not talking about five or ten percent difference sometimes it can be 50 percent or double the amount so i'm just wondering what local government is doing to, to to look at best practice in terms of service delivery so that the kind of margins of of, of service delivery are, are reduced so that you do get more efficiency with what ultimately despite all the discussions we have today is likely to be not a not a a great settlement for local government um I think the collaborative work that's been done around the local government benchmarking framework, um, that's getting deeper. You know, we've now got six years' worth of data. 
uh, the family groups of similar councils talking to each other, but actually there's been thematic workshops around, looked after children, economic development, um, and there's reports that will be published soon about what the best practice is, what the reasons for the differences, what's driving those differences, so that actually local government is getting better at understanding those differences and then sharing what's driving those differences and sharing what's good practice and what's working around that. So I think that really is a, a golden thread that has uh, is running through what we're trying to do now. OK, thanks. And just to, just to, to Vic, Vic, actual figures, I mean, I'm doing some sums here, actually, and uh, I notice you added inflation at 3%, 297 million. It's 289.2 million by my count, but I assume some of that is to do with living wage. But... It seems to be that the 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 the, the, the um, seventy million a year, which would represent one percent increase in salary, the total cost of that would be two hundred and ten million. Is that two hundred and ten million set against that two ninety seven million? Is it part of the two ninety seven million? Because the reason I'm asking that is because local government also has other revenue uh, uh, um, sources, such as, for example, uh, a three percent increase in council tax next year would provide another sixty two and a quarter million. And um, charging, which of course is even more than local authorities would, uh, would increase that total for 62 to 168 million. So, is all the have you, have you put in your re request for additional funding all the inflationary pressure caused by a three, an assumed three percent star wage increase um, onto the 9.640 um, billion, or is that in the overall local government settlement? Because if it's just if it's an overall local government settlement, that would mean there's 255 million of inflation in other areas of local government, which haven't been detailed. So the 9.640 billion <coughs> is not total spend. The yeah. 9.6 billion is is grant. So um, spend is um, <coughs> significantly more at the 12 billion. So if you what if if we would, I mean, I could run the figures for you um, in terms of total um, spend and inflate that of what would needed for spend in the future. Sorry, but this is focused on is grant. Not, sorry to interrupt, but you said 12 billion. Is it 15.3 billion? Give, just give. Vicky, I'll let you respond again, but we do have to move on shortly. Yeah. Vicky, maybe give you the opportunity to respond to some yeah. of that. Well, maybe this is something we can follow up on, because it depends if you want for spend. It's whether you want to include housing revenue account. There's a whole host of different elements of spend okay. that right. you can or cannot include. So I suppose a quick answer would be, no, it doesn't include charges in here okay. in the spend. So um, yes, but you could inflate charges on top of that. But maybe what might be useful for the committee is if I run figures on the total expenditure and break that down similarly. Yeah. This was on the grant element. Okay. Yes. Okay. Is that reasonable? And, and as part of that, back to what I was originally in a questioning, where integration funds would sit. Do that for you too. Would, would sit within that. I mean, I, I think it's a reasonable observation. I've been in this parliament for 10 years now, and it's not about party politics. Governments like to make the funding position of councils look as generous as possible, and councils like to make it look as bleak as possible. And then there's behind the scenes negotiations go on, and then you add the politics on top of that again. <coughs> we just want a bit of transparency in the figures, and we really genuinely do struggle in that. So any additional information would be welcome. <coughs> Now, the final line of questioning is in housing. Does anyone else have another theme before we move on to housing? I'm conscious we haven't asked about shared services yet. So not shared services, service redesign particularly yet. So just to make sure we get some evidence on that, can I just ask other examples of good quality service redesign and what reserves have been used for that rather than to plug gaps? and other spending, get some of that stuff on the record because it is going to be challenging political times and financial times for local authorities. So we have to see some good quality evidence of service redesign taking uh, local authorities forward. And it's not that I wanted to ask that question, colleagues, but I think we have to ask it as part of this particular process. So any comments on that, and then we'll move on to housing after that. Yeah, I think you've got Mr. some Day. general references within the evidence to work okay. that Glasgow and Renfrewshire and other kinds of that's done. One maybe a, a couple of examples. Um, one example that I think ties in with the digital, ties in with internal transformation, but leading to uh, service transformations around the work that Fife has done, particularly over the last um, five years, where they've very much looked at their asset base. It's about mobile and flexible working. 
They've reduced the number of office locations from 90 to 30, um, and they've generated about £20 million worth of savings for an investment of about £6 million. And that's not just transform, you might say, the efficiency of all services and how all staff work, but actually more recently they've moved that into the Care at Home initiative, where they, I think, and where they've now with the same workforce using the same investments they made for that transformation made in the 2010 to 2015 they're getting 1400 visits per per week for the compared to 1100 per week from the same workforce so that's just the the sort of major changes that can be possible i think the key point is that aberdeenshire and others have done similar work Others have tried to learn from that, but every council is starting from a different place and the investments and changes that are required to make it happen in each individual local authority uh, can be a challenge. I think a more interesting one is uh, coming at it from how working with the community transformation side, which maybe isn't quite to your point, but I think the work that East Ayrshire have done around vibrant communities and leading to 30 local action plans and looking at community asset transfers, which has generated a couple of million pounds of savings, but actually that's trying to look at a fundamentally different model of how you engage communities in the future of services and what's important for them. Um, and I think there's the sort of like support services stuff. Uh, one of the examples that's been used quite a lot um, has been the, the continuing work on bringing together internal shared services, support services. So Glasgow, tomorrow support services, that I think have generated about five million pounds worth of savings for them. It's helped build part of the digital customer service platform they need for the future that they're growing on. But again, I think about 10 other councils have actually gone and tried to look at how to, to build on that and use that. I don't know if that gives you enough or I, just I could give you more. Yeah, I, to, to be honest, Mr Dowie, I just want to make sure there's something on the public yeah, record yeah. in relation to this before we go to the report as yeah. part of our budget yeah. scrutiny. Just the final question, Mr Dowie, now to take Councillor McGregor in. Is there still more opportunities in relation to service redesign that local authorities could be capturing? Yes, I think the, absolutely, because I think both the pace at which, for example, um, uh, councils are moving their services online, there's just simple transactional efficiencies. I think the difficult one is when you move into more about how you're getting into the self-management, self-support, and how do you build the services around those types of transformations, I think. Uh, the balance between investment versus releasing efficiencies is going to be something that is a challenge. Um, so I think actually it's about getting the right level of investment and capacity to make those bigger changes and transformations, I think, is the challenge that require medium to longer term benefits. That's really helpful. Yeah. Councillor McGregor? Yeah, I, I think councils have been quite creative and certainly in, in working cross border as well with other councils and I think that, that will continue. There's always more that they can do and I think councils are very reflective at their practices and are always looking for a better way of working and that's absolutely right. Um, COSLA is looking at a sort of place-based um, initiative across all of public services. Um, so that's something that we're working on at the moment. Vic, Vicky will maybe pick up on that. But no, certainly I think absolutely um, where shared services and better opportunities and better working can be found. Um, councils are definitely looking at that and will continue to look at it. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll take Vicky Bibi in first and then we'll bring you back in, Mr Dewey. Um, I mean, COS is involved and we're working closely with government around sort of public service reform agenda. I think we recognise in light of the public finances, we all need to look at this. And as Councillor McGregor says, I think we're focusing more on place, bringing all public services together. And I think we're looking for a more permissive environment to allow public services to work better together, because I think there's great opportunities there. Um, local authorities uh, highlighted in the report have made 1. billion of efficiencies and the easy options have, have, have of course been done. Yes, there's more that can be done, but I think the greatest potential for savings is across <coughs> all public services coming together on a place-based okay. approach. I just want to give an example, a different example around uh, look after children and that more preventative work and trying to get into those longer term savings where people like uh, Councillor Gargyle and Butte and others are putting more wraparound care, kinship work, community work to stop children getting into the formal system as much as possible but then uh, also linking to apprenticeship schemes and things like that and actually focusing on getting looked after children into employment opportunities as well so there's a bit of joined up thinking around that that across councils that's just a, an interesting example of how targeting effort on those uh, higher risk and and higher demand areas are, are areas that councils are focusing on as well okay that's helpful uh, we'll move on now i know there's one or two areas uh, 
Right, we're Deputy Convener, what's the mop up on as well as housing? So, Elaine Smith. Thanks. First of all, Convener, can I apologise profusely for leaving the meeting earlier? It was a matter that was really urgent I had to deal with. I wouldn't normally be so rude. Um, and also, therefore, if I do ask something that's already been touched on, um, please forgive me for that. In relation to what Kenneth Gibson was asking earlier uh, and the, the council tax issue, I just wonder if, um, in terms of that, obviously some councils felt it was a bit of a blunt instrument and that, in actual fact, if they were going to be raising their taxes locally and impacting on people in that way, then they were looking to the Scottish Government to see what they were doing with their tax varying powers. And that brings me on to the question I wanted to ask you about um, the current situation with that, because the Scottish Government are taking soundings around the, the whole tax issue at the moment, so are costs lift feeding into that? Yes, absolutely. Um, at the moment, we're obviously in ongoing discussions in respect of the income tax, and, and there'll have to be some further consultation on that. Um, I, th I think, obviously, any additional funding that's raised through taxation at a national level will go to the government, um, and, and then how they distribute that will be absolutely within their gift. I think at local level, we're, we're engaged, and certainly I've personally been engaged in discussions in respect of council tax and, and, and the limits that we have, the, the flexibility that we have with that. Obviously, it was in the government's manifesto, and it's a commitment for the, the period of this parliament. But I think they're very open to any creative or innovative ideas around local taxation, um, and, and we'll discuss those within the round. Vicky, do you have anything for that pick up note? OK, thanks, which then, I suppose, brings me on to the housing budget quite nicely. And in your submission, Cosla, you, you talk about providing affordable housing and tackling homelessness, and particularly the... Um, the, the role that councils have in delivering the five, the, the 50,000 new affordable homes and also the, your statutory duties to uh, homelessness, tackling the, the numbers of rough sleepers. And these are things the committee are particularly interested in at the moment as well because we are looking into homelessness as, uh, as an inquiry that we're undertaking. So the question would be um, whether council's funding is sufficient at the moment to meet their statutory housing obligations and also any comments that you might have, Cosla, on the Scottish Government's um, housing supply budget and how that's helping local authorities to address the housing needs in their area. I'm going to defer to Vicky because this is an area that I am not fully um, up to speed on, but I think Vicky probably has a little bit of information. Um, I think Cosla's position is that um, it is found it ex well, local authorities have found it extremely helpful having the longer term indicative figures um, around housing supply. Um, you know, we've discussed that a lot apart from the core budget, but we've got that on the housing and that's that's really helpful. Um, where um, an area um, you'll be aware of, and we can follow up with more information, is Cosla still have um, concerns over the um, the level of subsidy that um, councils receive and the variances between that and RSLs. Um, again, um, if you want more information on that, I'm sure the committee's received it before, but we can provide that after. I think, again, in terms of some of the there's real opportunities in housing around the ener energy efficiency and potential with SEEPs, um, but that, again, is operating on a one-year um, basis. So I think a plea that COS has made quite strongly um, and is working very well with government on this is around um, for greater certainty and clarity around longer-term budgets um, around that. OK, thanks. And I think that's an interesting point you make, which I would imagine we would want to follow up on, because obviously it's councils that have the statutory duty towards homelessness, not the RSLs. So, oh, uh, yeah, for one, we'd be interested in further information there. I'll, I'll leave it there, convener, because I know we're short for time and other members might want to come in on the housing issue. OK, uh, thanks very much, Elaine Smith. Uh, move to Andy Whiteman now. Uh, thanks. Um, and we're all short of time, so just three brief questions, just to get some impressions on the record. Um, uh, Paul Dowie, you talked about you know preventative spending. I think you gave an example of Argyle. Um, one of the things that concerns me is that when councils do things that are innovative and they keep, for example young children at the criminal justice system and that saves the criminal justice system money. H how do we account for that? Because the incentive's not really there because there's no consequential cut to justice department's money. 
Um, or if local government does something that um, makes people more healthy, uh, there's no consequential accounting in the health service. Do you have any sense of the need to try and create some kind of circular model that helps drive preventative spending to ensure that people are not disincentivized because they just feel that they're not going to get the benefits that somebody else is creating? Do you get the point I'm trying to make? Yeah, well, I, I get it. And, uh, I think it was like anything we try to focus on the outcome and trying to account for that in a way. I think anecdotally we're getting better at pulling that together. I go back to, I think, the local outcome improvement plans. I think we'll give a joint focus. We're actually trying to get some measurable view of progress being made jointly on that will we'll help to that. So I think it is a work in progress that I think all the things we're doing and have got better at over the, uh, the last few years will help us to do that. But I think it is a major challenge. And I think it goes back to that investment point is that part of the problem here is how do you decide what's going to work? How do, how, do, how do you decide that actually investing in a new model of preventative work as opposed to in the current search you have is actually going to pay back in revenue reduction later on somewhere in the system? But even within an individual council, how do you make that as an investment decision or even fund that as an investment decision is something that we are going to have to, to grapple with. So I don't have an answer, but I think we're making the right sort of progress to getting the information that will support us in doing that better. Okay, that that, that's helpful. Just a the brief second question is also on the... Yep. No, don't feel the need to respond, but just in case you want to respond to any of that. Okay, Ms. Uh, gender pay gap, what are councils doing to try and close the gender pay gap, and is that built into budget forecasting? Yeah. Yeah, we've got paper going to the Equalities Committee fairly soon, I think, haven't we? Um, so we get, that's something we could supply uh, out with the committee today, if that's okay. I mean, obviously, councils are, are, are doing their level best to, to close the gender pay gap, and, and certainly at local level, um, they're setting themselves targets, whether they're meaningful or not. Um, it's, a, it's a very difficult conversation to have, but I, I think certainly, particularly in the higher paid um, bands within local authorities where there is a larger disparity, um, that, that they're certainly trying to do more to, to sort of get a better ratio. But as I said, we have a, a report coming fairly soon, so we could supply that to you as well. Okay, and final question just on climate change. I mean, we're anticipating uh, more ambitious climate change targets. Um, there's moves at a sort of European level, international mm -hmm. level, to look at locally determined contributions that local government has a a firm role together with national contributions. Uh, what thinking is going in in terms of future budgeting on the kind of areas like transport and planning and housing and energy efficiency that local government can play a big role in, um, in terms of this is again a, an item of preventative spending, but this is preventing carbon emissions. I, 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 just a couple of observations. I don't have a, 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 an overview of cross local government on that, but I suppose Aberdeenshire, I suppose, have done the innovative thing of actually setting a carbon budget and building that into their budget setting process, and the, that's the first one in Scotland to do that. So I think that's one example. Um, and I think in the Fife example I mentioned earlier, part of the target there was you know to get rid of three and a half thousand tonnes of of carbon uh, as part of those projects. So I think um, it's part of many council policy setting processes and things like that. It will be one of the things that's factored into policy decisions that are made. Okay, thanks. Can I just check a couple of things in, in relation to housing? Really interesting answer in relation to uh, the subsidy for social. Uh, new build social rented housing within the regular social landlord sector compared to local authorities and whether there was an inequity there in, 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 in relation to some of that. It, is there a difference though in terms of quite often local authorities don't have land costs necessarily within some of their new build properties whereas reg other regular social landlords may have to actually purchase land ironically sometimes from local authorities as well so just some reflections on that would be quite helpful something we can follow up on. I mean, we, we will have evidence at Coslet of, of the, the sort of differences between, um, and, and obviously, as you say, you, you, we do have local authorities who no longer have housing stock, but have RSLs who are very proactive in their areas. It will be data that we have, and certainly we'll get that mm -hmm. to you out with the committee, if that's okay. No, that would be good, because the, the key, I yeah. think I think, I think it's quite an important made, question, actually, yeah. Well, 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 I, th I think we got evidence to say uh -huh. you felt there was an th th there was inequity there, so uh -huh. just try to follow up and whether there is or mm -hmm. actually th th there isn't, I suppose. Mm -hmm. in, in relation to the affordable housing investment programme, would you recognise that 
has been fairly substantial and will continue to be fairly substantial with indicative budgets over a number of years? Mm -hmm. I, th I think that we found that very helpful, that, that we've got mm -hmm. the indicative numbers um, over the years. Um, Councillor Parry has a lot of detail on this area. We can follow up um, very soon, because I know you'll need it as part of your evidence okay. on the particular... Um, issues you've raised well, in housing. So I'm just trying to get a balance to it because the committee might decide that it, it's compelled by much of your evidence that may not in terms of longer term financial planning yes. but if the affordable housing budget is an example of the Scottish Government delivering on that yeah. it would be good to get that on the record so do you feel that's an example of the Scottish Government delivering on that? Absolutely and it's very welcomed. Okay, that, that, that's helpful. And the, 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 the final question in relation to, to that would be, we've been doing an inquiry into homelessness and Deputy Mayor mentioned uh, statutory duties of local authorities. One of the questions that I'd asked during that inquiry was that a more clever use of the affordable housing budget because if you're building new houses, how you invest in that, how you allocate those and how you create a sense of place for those at the, at the, at who are most vulnerable in society, who are homeless and rough sleeping, something imaginative around that could really pay great dividends in tackling those who are most vulnerable and homeless, but also meeting that 50,000 target that we all share. So is there consideration around that by COSLA, do you think? Um, I know that Councillor Parry and um, officers within COSLA are um, involved in the development of the Homelessness Prevent Strategy Group, and I know this is an area that they're discussing um, particularly there, and again, apologies we don't have the information to hand, but I can certainly follow up with something formal from COSLA on that. No, that's fine. I know, I know it's, it can be quite random sometimes what, what committee members do or don't ask, and you plan for one line of questioning, then another one emerges. That's just the nature of, of, of these events, and it's also very difficult to uh, discuss budget scrutiny, but we actually none of us really know what the numbers are really going to be, so it's a little bit of shadow oh, boxing. Course. <laughs> yeah, but imminently, perhaps, ab yeah. Abs absolutely, perhaps we should have done this next week. Um, but thank you. Just before we close this evidence session, I want to say, did any other member get anything they want to raise with the witnesses before we do that? Okay. Well, thank you uh, to our three witnesses for, for giving evidence today and follow up and write with some of the matters we've discussed. Uh, so we'll end this evidence session here and we now move into agenda item three, which we've previously agreed to take in private. Thank you. Thank you.